Tech stocks rally, treasury bonds rest, and crude oil sinking toward the longest slump of the year. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Scarlett Fu. We're kicking off to the closing bell here in the U.S. You look at equities right now, and the S&P 500 breaking out from two weeks of fairly modest moves, thanks to big tech. It's up eight-tenths of one percent. That is the biggest advance in about three weeks, uh, well above 4,500. And, of course, the Magnificent Seven is the big reason why. That group up more than two percent, led by Alphabet, after it released its AI offering called Gemini. We'll have more on that later on. The 10-year yield barely moving here. Uh, you can see it's at 4.11%, a little bit of a pullback, a rest. Uh, the 10-year yield, of course, coming off yesterday, a three-month low. We'll see if tomorrow's jobs report really validates the recent rally in Treasuries. And just want to highlight the yen. It's really on a roll here, gaining against all the major currencies. There's been a series of clues over the last couple of weeks, um, last couple of days, really, suggesting the end of negative Negative interest rates is perhaps coming. Comments from the BOJ governor as well as his deputies. Romain? Yeah, a big move in the yen. We should point out a big move in Japanese uh, government bonds as well and a big move in U.S. government bonds too. In fact, a week ago Thursday, short-dated Treasury sold off. 24 hours later, they clawed back the previous day's losses. By the following Monday, Treasury sold off again, erasing Friday's gain. Then Tuesday, then Wednesday, and now back here on Thursday, the cycle has continued. Six straight daily flip-flops in direction as part of a meaningful uptick in volatility that actually began in late September and really points to a meaningful buy-the-dip mentality among bond investors, which in turn suggests that maybe we should be talking less about the peak in rates and more about where the bottom might be. We'll get back to what Japan is doing because they're going in the opposite direction. Meanwhile, the flip-flop in equities today from sell-off to rally really shouldn't be too much of a surprise. Quant strategists at Bank of America led by Savita Subramanian, said market breadth has improved dramatically already and may actually expand next year and propel the S&P past 5,000. Take the Magnificent Seven, Apple, NVIDIA, Amazon, Meta, Tesla, Alphabet, Microsoft. Take those out of the equation. Even if those mega cap names remain flat and the price to earnings ratio of the rest of the S&P, the other 493 stocks, that holds steady. Profit growth forecast would still put the index at 5,100, according to her models. She also notes that only 24% of the S&P 500 stocks are trading within 10% of their record highs. That's way lower than prior bull market peak. But, and there's always a but, Marco Kalanovich over at J.P. Morgan says maybe not. The risk reward for equities, in his view, is poor relative to cash and relative to bonds. And he sees a bit of a catch-22 here, Scarlett, with risk assets unable to sustain rallies if monetary policy remains tight, but a Fed that says we're going to remain tight unless we actually see a correction in risk assets. Yeah, it's quite the situation, yeah. isn't it? In other words, he says that he doesn't see the Fed cutting rates unless markets tank or the economy really stalls out. And for that reason, Kalanovich is pessimistic when compared to his peers. Take a look here. He sees the S&P 500 falling to 4,200. That is a red horizontal line here by the end of next year. That is almost 12% below the average year-end target of strategists, which is the dotted yellow line. And of course, Romanian was just telling us about Savada Subranamnium, who's at 5,000. It's also down, by the way, from 4,800, uh, which was yesterday's close, or I should say about 8% from yesterday's close. So quite a long way to go there. Let's, in the meantime, turn to the economic economic data because today's offering was jobless claims, which show that initial filings for unemployment benefits did edge higher to 220,000. Those are the white bars. The 12-week average, the blue line shows that we've really flattened out at around 212,000. It's really yet another sign remain that the labor market is indeed cooling. Yeah, we're certainly going to find out when we get the monthly numbers tomorrow morning. Team surveillance will be all over that. 8.30 a.m. Washington time. Meanwhile, right here this afternoon on the close, we kicked things off with Seema Shah, chief global strategist over uh, at Principal Asset uh, Management. And Seema, I want to go back to some of the expectations for corporate for profitability into 2024, deeper into 2024. Profit forecasts, at least when you average them out, seem to be much more focused on an expansion of margins. And I'm wondering, A, whether you think we will see a meaningful expansion in those margins, and if not, why? Hey, Romain. So we are a little bit concerned about the margin expansion expectations. Typically, if you're expecting to see inflation continue to decelerate, there will be pressures. Uh, companies can no longer keep um, adding on price increases when you have 
inf disinflation. So that is one of the concerns. It's actually one of the reasons why we think the first half of next year could be a little bit more challenging. Uh, as you start to see a bit of an economic slowdown, inflation coming down, we do think there's going to be a few pressures. But I think that is fairly short-lived, right? As soon as you get enough economic weakness to prompt the Fed to cut rates, which we think is going to be in the second half of, of next year, I should say June of next year, then I think you start to open the airways for an equity market rally. With fairly solid earnings growth, I don't think it's going to be a banger of a year in terms of earnings, but I think equity markets can do pretty well ending next year at a fairly higher level than where we are today. Will, will central banks be a big factor in, I guess, where markets go next, or are we beyond that? No, I think they are. And I think that, as I said, I think the market has gone a little bit too far with its rate cut expectations. And that's one of the reasons why I think the first half, especially the first quarter, could be somewhat volatile for the bond space and also for the equity market space. To get a sustained equity market rally, though, you do need, at some point in 2024, for those rate cuts to come through and that to be combined with a fairly soft landing. Now, the good thing is that that is what we see as our scenario. Um, but it is absolutely dependent on the Fed moving ahead with rate cuts. However, when it comes to the Fed moving ahead with rate cuts, you see a different path than what much of the market sees. Uh, we're pricing in four to five rate cuts for next year. You're talking more about a gradual policy easing. What would that look like? Yeah, so we expect the first cut to come in June and then to move at 25 bips per quarter. So it's a total of 75 basis points in the, as a whole in 2024. And the main reason is, is that, look, we're expecting a soft downturn. And if you have a soft downturn, then you need some soft cuts. There's no real reason to go pretty aggressively. Uh, I think that's key. You know, the, if we are wrong, the reason that we'd be wrong is that the economic downturn is deeper, in which case the Fed is forced to, to slam on the brakes a little bit harder. Uh, that is not. That would not be good news uh, for markets. You need to have a little bit of both, the cuts, but also the soft landing. Yeah, it's, it's a tricky needle to thread, isn't it? Uh, we talked a little bit earlier, or Romain mentioned uh, the drop in oil prices. It's edging a little bit higher right now, but still below that $70 a barrel. How much comfort do you take from falling oil prices when it comes to the overall inflation picture? Or is it still too volatile to really be a source of much comfort? Well, it's clearly a comfort right now. I mean, one of the, you know, it's even take back about six weeks. That was one of the main concerns, what would happen to oil prices and how would the Middle East intentions then spill over to the broader economy. And of course, so far, we haven't seen that, that happen. Uh, but as I go into 2024, I am a little bit worried. It feels like the market is a little bit complacent. It's underpricing some of the inflation risks. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why we do think that the Fed will be watching oil prices carefully. They know that inflation expectations typically follow oil prices pretty quickly. And we have heard time and time again that their key concern is making sure that inflation expectations don't become de-anchored. So, you know, it's not a key risk at this stage, but it's something certainly for investors to keep watching. And it's one of the other reasons why we don't expect the Fed to cut as soon as March, but pushing it back till they have real comfort and confidence that inflation is on a clear downward path. All right, Seema, always great to talk to you. Seema Shog, Chief Global Strategist over at Principal Asset Management, helping to kick things off to the close here on this Thursday afternoon. Coming up after the break, a discussion about the health of the restaurant sector. Brian Nickel, the chairman and CEO of Chipotle, going to be joining the big program later today. Plus, Broadcom is set to publish its latest results after the bell. It'll be the company's first report card since closing its acquisition of VMware. We'll get you a preview of what to watch for in the numbers. And another great interview coming up a little bit later with the U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai. David Weston, the host of Wall Street Week, had a chance to catch up with her just a few minutes ago. We'll let you know what she had to say. All that more coming up in just a bit. This is Bloomberg. The weekly U.S. jobless claims came out this morning, setting the stage for that big monthly payrolls report tomorrow. Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Editor Michael McKee joining us right now for a preview of that. Scarlett was just talking about those initial claims you got. I was looking at the four-week average. We've kind of been at stasis for a while. And when I look at non-farm payroll numbers, they've also kind of settled into a little bit of a range, too. Well, actually, we're forecasting a rise in non-farm yeah. payrolls this month, in part because of the UAW workers going back to work. So uh, 180. 
75 is the forecast, but if you take off the 33,000 mm -hmm. auto workers who were left out last time, you get down to more around 150, and it is a little bit of an easing from where we have been. It was 150 the prior month. Uh, jobless claims, the interesting thing is the week that they take the survey was the one week that we saw the big bump up uh, in jobless claims. So there are some people thinking that yeah. could skew the numbers lower. So do you think the market will start, will, will understand these little quirks or will they read too much into the data as they always do? <laughs> uh, they'll read something into the data. I think people will understand the headline quirk. They'll immediately do a 33,000 subtraction in their head or they'll look at manufacturing jobs and, and, uh, and subtract that. Uh, what will probably get people's attention is if there's any surprise in the unemployment rate mm -hmm. or if we get a big jump in the average hourly earnings. We're expecting a, a slight jump month over month and a drop to 4% for year over year, which the Fed would see as good news because they see 3 to 3.5% 3 as sustainable with 2% inflation. Uh, I do want to pivot uh, just a little bit away from the U.S. There's so much focus right now on these sort of rate hiking cycles coming to a close at the Fed and other major central banks. Meanwhile, of course, all the rage this morning was, uh, I guess, some comments. I don't know if they were offhand or not uh, by Kazuo Aide over at the BOJ and one of his deputies that seemed to suggest, I guess if you're a betting man, that we could actually start seeing some rate hikes going on in Japan. Yeah, well, Japan has been signaling yeah. for a while that it's getting close to yeah. the end of yield curve control. Yeah. And yesterday, uh, the governor of the Bank of Japan went before the parliament and during his testimony said that uh, policymaking will become much more challenging from year end and into next year. Then he went to meet with the prime minister to talk about monetary policy mm -hmm. and people took that as a sign that yeah. something's coming up soon. The question is when. I mean, as I said, they've been hinting about this for a while. There's no real thought in the markets that they're going to do it next week when they meet. But yeah. when they meet in January, they publish a new inflation forecast. We get the results of the what they call the Shunto, the uh, countrywide wage negotiations in March. Uh -huh. And they do a new, another inflation forecast in April. So right now, the market is thinking April with the inflation forecast. And, and they will know now <laughs> then what what roughly the wage situation yeah, That's perfect. Be. Just in time for the Fed cuts. Just in time. <laughs> Just in time. Yeah, about the same time. <laughs> so, of course, what's important here to remember, and of course we saw the yen strengthen on all of this, is that if Japan does move ahead with interest rate increases, make the rates less negative and move out of that, that range, then that's going to influence a whole wave of money. And it could come out of treasuries. And of course, the Japanese are big, big buyers of treasuries. It's a little bit hard at this point to know exactly what the impact's going to be. Remember, they move in like 10 basis point increments. So if they went to zero, uh, it's better mm. <laughs> for uh, for uh, if you're investing, but it isn't going to make you rich. So does it really mean we move, see a lot of movement uh, go through right away? Um, and also, there's so much involved in terms of uh, what the carry trade is going to be and where the U.S. is going to be and where other countries are going to be that uh, the analysts I've talked to say it will have some effect, but we can't really really predict yeah. too much right now. This has been the question of the day, is like, where does the carry trade go? Because if you if you just go to the yeah. terminal and try to find a, a stable country, I should say, that it has good, like, a good luck finding it. Well, yeah. not yeah. one with a uh, yeah. very deep and liquid currency. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Mike McKee, thank you so much. Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Editor Michael McKee. Let's stay with uh, the realm of policy and move to Washington uh, goings on, because Nikki Haley took the spotlight at the fourth GOP debate willingly or not, because her opponents were criticizing her ties to Wall Street. Her major backers do include J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon, the billionaire Bill Ackman, and the industrialist Charles Koch. Even with that support, she's still in a distant second place compared to the frontrunner Donald Trump, who, of course, has not attended any of the debates. The latest Wall Street Journal poll shows the former president with an unchanged lead of 59 percent, hailing climbing to 15 percent in recent months. Bloomberg U.S. Politics Deputy Editor Laura Davison joins us now with more. So, Laura, is it fair to say that um, Nikki Haley won last night's debate? And, and does it even matter if she won if the frontrunner isn't showing up and isn't a factor? 
Yeah, Haley is a very strong debater. This is now the fourth time that she's had a, a great debate night. Um, and it was clear from last night that she uh, was the one that everyone else views as the one to beat. Um, she uh, was fielding attacks from all sides uh, and did pretty well at, at, at holding up and fielding those attacks. Um, one note in particular is that um, uh, particularly DeSantis and Vivek Ramaswamy were going after her for having some big uh, name donors, the ones that are just listed on the screen there. Uh, and she basically uh, shot back, hey, you guys are just jealous, uh, especially DeSantis. You used to have these donors, and now I do. Uh, so this is really you know, shows the changing contours of the race where Haley was pulling in the single digits and now is, uh, seems to be the main Trump alter uh, alternative. Yeah, well, talk to us a little bit about how viable that alternative is. I mean, it's one thing to say she's surging in the polls, but last time I checked, I mean, she's still significantly, significantly trailing the former president. Yeah, it is uh, not clear at all that she has uh, the, the momentum to surpass Trump. You know, he is still leading uh, in virtually every state and nationally, you know, by uh, upwards of 30 percentage points. So that is a huge deficit to make up. Um, you know, it, it's uh, the candidates, the theory of the case is that they can go into Iowa where things are a little bit less clear, there's less good polling, and they might be able to pull out an upset. That is still really a Hail Mary shot and unclear if that will actually uh, come out to, uh, for Haley or for any other candidate. Laura, we mentioned a couple of people who are supporting her, but have they donated money to her? Have they, you know, put her at the center of their contributions? So uh, Charles Koch and his network um, of Americans for Prosperity has committed to put money behind her. Uh, they haven't said how much. Uh, but some of these other folks, Jamie Dimon, um, as well as Bill Ackman, have not said affirmatively if they're donating to her. Uh, they have expressed support for her. And uh, the FEC, the Federal Election Commission, uh, we're in a little bit of a blind spot on when those filings. But come January, we'll be able to see uh, who are the big name donors giving to Trump campaign Haley and across the board. All right, Laura Davison, Bloomberg's U.S. politics deputy, really appreciate your joining us, giving us the latest on the Republican debates. I don't know if you've been watching any of these. Have you? Uh, uh, zero. Uh, no, I mean, look, I watch them as a journalistic exercise, but I mean, uh, uh, and, and I don't want to belittle her too much here. But again, you have to look at the differential in polling yeah, between I know. her. And it's one thing to say, okay, yeah, she's risen up in the polls, but that's like, you know, like I said, you go from, you know, single digits to 12%, yeah. and Trump's is at, you know, 50%, and it's like, like, okay, is that an alternative? I don't care how many, you know, big bankers are willing to give her money. At the end of the day, they need real people who are going to vote for her uh, in the primary to get behind her. And I don't and, know who those people are. And that's it ain't why Bill Ackman. And it ain't Jamie Dimon. And it ain't who they put up there. One of the Koch brothers? Yeah, Charles Koch. Are they both still alive or just one of them? Uh, I don't know. Okay. But Charles Koch did okay. put some money behind her. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, the big question here is a lot of the corporate donations have really dried up. And they're back at the level since, I would think, before the 2016 elections. Yeah. They just don't seem to like any of the well, we had a great story on the Bloomberg terminal yesterday about how a lot of the big donors kind of have their uh, pocketbooks closed for yeah. now, probably just waiting They're to like see. They're like crossing their arms saying, no. Yeah, it's like they don't want to Trump, but, you know, if Trump gets a nomination, I'm sure they'll, they'll whip out the pocketbooks. So. All right, this we've is, got this much is more politics ahead. in the U.S. Here. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Don't get us started. This yeah. is the close on Bloomberg. <laughs> All right, we want to turn to a Bloomberg exclusive. We're learning that officials at the Pentagon, that's the Department of Defense here in the United States, they buy drugs for our service members. And apparently they've been in a battle with the Food and Drug Administration, another government agency, over the quality of some of those drugs. Now, the issue centers around generics that are made overseas. Riley Griffin joining us right now is one of the reporters who worked on that story. And Riley, this was a, a great look here because basically, so for those folks who don't know, the FDA basically approves drugs here in the United States. States. DOD, the Pentagon, is buying these drugs for their soldiers. And DOD apparently raised some issues with the FDA as to whether certain drugs were being manufactured in accordance with, I guess, whatever baseline standards the FDA would have. Is that right? Yeah. So over the, the past few years, decades even, we've seen production uh, shift overseas. Now 80 percent of FDA approved um, facilities for the production of generic drugs are in India and China and elsewhere abroad. And the problem that that's posed for the FDA is limited oversight. It's very difficult to inspect these facilities, and we've seen recalls and drug shortages spur as a result. What the Defense Department has stepped in and said is they don't necessarily trust all of the generic drugs that they're serving to their troops. And so they've launched a study as of late to look behind the curtain and see which of the drugs 
drugs are doing well, which are performing poorly, in an effort to better scan those medicines. Okay, so they're still in the gathering information stage to understand, um, you know, just how much of an issue this might be. What policies, specific policies, have been discussed uh, across Washington to improve uh, the drug shortages and the quality issues? That's a great question. Ultimately, this year, we've seen acute drug shortages. And, and what I want to tell you now is that most drug shortages are actually a result of these underlying production and quality issues. And so we've seen the White House take an active approach. Um, earlier this year, they debated a $25 billion package of the likes of the CHIPS Act um, for the pharmaceutical industry. But that kind of fell apart in the beginning stages of the, the year we reported. And so there are real questions of what the administration is going to do to address these quality issues and drug shortages. Today, we did see the Biden administration take a new tactic with the prices of large cap pharmaceuticals, but this does not go to addressing yeah. the quality issues with generic drugs. Well, let's talk about that as well, because that story really jumped out on me. Uh, that is the latest story. I mean, he's basically saying that they're going to claw back uh, some of the patent protection on these things as a way to lower prices. I, I'm not sure legally if that's even allowed, but explain it to me how he thinks he's going to pull this off. Yeah, it, you know, it's still early stages, so we have to see how this pans out. But the Biden administration has looked at the law and said, ultimately, we think that with taxpayer-funded research and development, so companies that have brought products to market through taxpayer dollars, they can, if the product is priced out of reach of patients, claw back those patents and license them to an additional manufacturer to produce them potentially at a lower price, competition driving down prices. And so um, what we're seeing here is a draft proposal or a, a new framework, if you will. Senior administration officials told us last night that they haven't necessarily or they declined to identify drugs that they would target. Um, and so we're not seeing Wall Street really react strongly to this today, even if trade associations are. And of course, next year is a presidential election year. Uh, if a Republican, if the former president, uh, Donald Trump, comes back, what has his administration done on this? Because they had been pretty vocal when it came to pharmaceutical pricing. You know, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, drug pricing is always a selling point at the ballot box, um, especially for seniors on, on Medicare and folks on Medicaid. And so the Trump administration has similarly said that they're coming after big pharma. The approaches they take are, are often different, and one approach the Trump administration had pushed when they were in the seat of power was to say that they wanted to set prices to the reference points that other countries pay for drugs. Mm. The United States pays more for drugs than any other country in the world. And so that was one of the um, approaches that they tried to push forward. All right. Well, everybody's been coming for Big Pharma for years, and Big Pharma just keeps getting bigger. That's me laughing in Big Pharma. Riley Griffin, <laughs> uh, a couple of great stories on the Bloomberg Terminal, including the Biden administration looking to seize pat patents of costly drugs, Scarlett, in order to lower costs. And the great story uh, from earlier uh, this week, uh, really on uh, kind of an awful story, really, about some of the inconsistencies and the quality of drugs that our troops are getting. Yeah, absolutely. And, of course, this is relevant, especially as all these big drug companies are looking to make purchases of other companies that make weight loss drugs, because that has a patent that's going to be, you know, paying off for yeah. years to come. Yeah, I'd like to see the Biden administration <laughs> pry that patent out of the hands of uh, Novo Nordisk and uh, Lilly and the other companies. Uh, that is right. A lot more coming up here on the program, including a closer look at the massive shutdown in ETS that we've had this year. That conversation coming up after the break. This is The Close on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close, just about 2.30 here in New York. A bit of a rally going on right now in the equity space. Treasury's taking a bit of a breather, but still a lot of activity going on in commodities. Let's get right to Abigail Doolittle, who's standing by with our commodities close. Abigail. There is quite a bit of action remaining in Scarlett. Take a look at New York crude. Well, down to the wire here and down ever so slightly. It had been higher earlier, a bit of a recovery from the big five-day decline that we had below $70 per barrel. Well, we are still there. So those technicals that we took a look at yesterday and over the last couple of months they're in play uh, the seller is very much in control supply fears uh, to some degree that there might uh, be too much and maybe on the demand side as well copper not talking about a demand issue uh, copper a big tell on uh, the 
health, a barometer of global, uh, the global economy and global demand uh, doing very well today. Wheat also higher, up 1.4%. And the big winner today, cotton up 3.6%. I think that there was some crop decimation uh, near the Ivory Coast or in Ivory Coast, Romaine, uh, that uh, is helping give a lift to cotton. But one thing to note, we do have that Bloomberg dollar index lower that helps all commodities except apparently oil. All right, uh, Abigail Doolittle with a closer look at what's going on in the commodity space. We should say we're still awaiting on that official settlement on NYMEX crude. If it does hold in the red here, six straight days of losses here, that would match its longest losing streak of the year. Meanwhile, we want to turn to ETFs, which also are not necessarily having a good year. The notoriously saturated $7.7 trillion industry riding the pandemic era wave of launches, but the tide's turning. 234 issuers have either liquidated or delisted this year. That's compared to 159 last year and just 72 the year before. Emily Grafeo, cross-asset reporter here at Bloomberg, joining us right now to talk a little bit more about this. This is the second biggest uh, rate of closures we've had, right, on an annual basis ever? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's also the record year for launches, though. We saw over 400 launching. Mm -hmm. So I think it really underscores just how large and competitive the ETF market is getting to see this many funds closing and also issuers really coming out with new ideas. Mm -hmm. You really have to get it right, not just on the strategy, the marketing, but also the performance, because it is really getting more competitive in this world. And we know that the meme stock ETF closed down, ticker was MEME, -E, but what have been, what, what's the common thread across the ETFs that did shut down? So we saw about 10% of the closures came for thematic ETFs, so the meme one is a good example, something where it's not just like a factor, but the issuer comes up with an idea, slaps a theme on it. Um, there were some digital asset ETFs that closed, which this was a good year for digital yeah, asset it's strategies. Curious, yeah. It's not always the performance um, for why a fund closes. It's usually more the size. If the fund can't get to a certain number of assets, I've heard 50 million, 100 million, 200, then usually that's why we see it shutter. So I think that meme ETF, it was like something under 13 million in assets. Uh, some of the closures that we've seen in this space also have to do with ESG. Mm -hmm. uh, what drove that? Was that just lack of interest, underperformance, or did it have something to do with the political football that ESG has become? A little bit of everything. Okay. I think one of the things was the lack of interest. This was actually the first year that we saw net outflows from ESG ETFs, and that followed 10 straight years of inflows into ESG-branded funds that um, mm. Bloomberg tracks. We saw 14 ESG funds close this year. But like you said, the term ESG has become really weaponized. Even Larry Fink, who at first was championing uh, that idea, came out this year and said, it's too politicized, yeah. it's too weaponized, I don't want to fund. But we had talked yeah. about a few and months ago, like yeah. now there's some funds that come out well, that aren't branded with ESG. Well, I was just going to say that. I mean, we've, how many times have we seen this now where these funds just kind of kind of taking the back door? Still an ESG fund, but just not <laughs> right. calling themselves an ESG fund. They're like a water you actually, ETF. You have to actually look what's in there. I know no one who buys ETFs actually looks at the holdings anymore. But, you know, <laughs> You're supposed to. That's, someone's supposed to do the work on that. What are the themes to watch for next year? Because you said it was a record year in terms of launches. I presume that there's going to be a lot of excitement about new ETFs. What draw? What's the common thread there? There's a lot of active launches. We saw about Which 80 like percent, fees, of course. Yes, obviously, more than 80 percent of all the launches, according to Bloomberg Intelligence, were actually active. And this year, we saw about 25 percent of the inflows into ETFs at large go to active ETFs, which is a record. So a lot of superlatives for the active space. And I think when you have a lot of new legacy mutual fund issuers coming in, they usually come to market with an active strategy. It just blends more with what they've already been doing. You can keep the same portfolio manager. BlackRock comes to mind. They had Rick Reeder, who obviously manages a lot of fixed income funds, come on to a fixed income ETF and actively manage that. It's like omni-channel shopping. You give every one, the, the, the different wrappers, the different formats, but it's the exactly. same blend. Whatever they want, they can get it. <laughs> Bloomberg's Emily Grafeo, thank you so much. Emily Grafeo covers cross assets for us here at Bloomberg News. Um, I think about ETFs and some of the leverage ETFs have become really popular with Korean retail traders, especially the ones that are like four times, three times leveraged on single stocks. 
Okay, uh, then we have that here in the U.S. and we saw how. That no, these out. are the ones in the U.S. that they're okay. buying up because yeah. they're looking for a little bit of excitement. This is, I mean, Korean excitement. is a very retail-driven yeah. stock market in yeah. general, and the U.S. stock market has been going gangbusters this year. Yeah, but leverage three times. Yeah. Triple leverage. It's okay. Triple leverage. All right. Well, I mean, like I said, we went through the, the double leverage, triple leverage phase of some of these ETFs before, and mm -hmm. how did that end for a lot of folks? Well, you know, if you can get out beforehand, it ends great. That's great. It's like musical <laughs> chairs. Absolutely. You never lose. So fun. Always fun as long as the music is playing. All right, still ahead. Broadcom is due to post quarterly results after the closing bells. Investors pretty keen to see the chipmaker's performance since buying and closing out its VMware purchase. We're going to preview what to expect next. This is The Close. I'm Bloomberg. Let's get a view from the sell side with our top calls, the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start with ChargePoint. This is the electric car charging company. They came out with their third quarter results yesterday, and the revenue was below estimates. That spurred a downgrade over at B. Riley to neutral with the analysts, also slashing the price target in half, saying there just aren't enough near-term catalysts right now for growth. Investors beg to disagree, pushing those shares up for one of those best days in quite a while. Meanwhile, Biogen getting an upgrade today to outperform for market perform. This over at Raymond James with the analysts there saying the biotech company has an attractive setup into 2024 with progress on that company's early Alzheimer's treatment as well as improvement in its research and development costs. Shares of that company up about 2% on the day. And finally, let's take a look at Alphabet announcing the rollout of its new large language AI model, Gemini. Roth MKM lifting its price target to 166 from 152 with the analysts saying that Gemini should usher in a new era over at Google and spark an up tick in valuation for Alphabet, putting the stock more in line with the rest of its magnificent seven peers. It's outperforming those peers today higher by 5%. And those are our top calls. All right, let's stay in tech here and move a little bit forward. We're expecting to get results after the bell out of Broadcom. A lot of questions right now about the health of this company and more importantly, the integration of VMware. VJ Rakesh joining us, senior analyst covering chips and automotive tech over at Mizuho. He currently has a buy rating on Broadcom. All right, VJ, let's first start off uh, with the handset market because we know this is obviously the legacy business and still an important one, although I know they are trying to diversify. How much is that handset business holding up right now? Yeah, thanks for having me on, Romain. I think uh, if you look at uh, Broadcom, obviously they are the top supplier to Apple. Uh, and so if you look at uh, iPhone 15 here, sales have uh, held up, uh, at least in the U.S., uh, they're probably a little challenged over out in China. But that said, you know, seasonally it's a strong quarter for them. Uh, should be a tailwind for uh, Broadcom uh, in, the, in the October quarter and the guide. Uh, but obviously, uh, you know, as you go into March, there's a little bit of seasonality and they have some challenges in China with the made 60 out there so something to watch but uh, obviously for Broadcom there are other segments that will probably outperform like AI mm -hmm. networking etc on the tails of uh, you know on the back of Ethernet networking and yeah. uh, custom ASIC that they ship to Google so well, why I'm curious then if you can kind of explain what is going to drive growth let's just take revenue growth for example we've gone from double digit revenue growth on a quarterly basis now into single digits but when I started to look at analyst estimates looking out a little bit further over the next say five six Six quarters, I see a return back to those double-digit growth rate. What what gets us there? Yeah, I think if you look at uh, most of the segments outside of AI in, and networking, uh, they have been fairly soft, kind of reflecting what the macro is. So if you look at enterprise storage, that's been fairly soft. Industrial has been soft for them. And and, and much of the consumer exposed segments have been soft, uh, including even, I would say, broadband. Uh, but that said, you know, where they see very strong growth will be on the AI side, where that's going 100% year on year, probably grow on the 70% year on year into fiscal 24 October, uh, but also the, the networking side, the Ethernet networking. So everybody is starting to move the Ethernet as the most widely accepted standard open source. You know, you heard that from AMD yesterday as well. Uh, so we think that's where the growth will, uh, will come for Broadcom looking out. So. This, of course, will be Broadcom's first set of results since uh, the VMware purchase closed and it's completely integrated into the company. What could the company say, what could Broadcom say that might trip up investors or give them something to worry about? 
No, I think Scarlett, uh, VMware should be a nice, uh, you know, uh, basically a nice bow to this present because if you look at uh, Broadcom, they obviously drive the on you know, the industry standard in terms of 75% gross margin, 60% plus operating margin, 50% free cash flow yield. So VMware will just add to it. If you look at VMware today, it's somewhere in the 30% uh, operating margin. I think you could easily see Hawk drive that to 55, 60% operating margins. Uh, and so you, you that should drive very big free cash flow, probably a big bump up in dividends for Broadcom from some of the $18, $19 dividends that they're here to might be the mid-20s as you look at next year. So mm. uh, big jump in free cash flow, big jump in dividends. Um, obviously, it'll, it'll need a lot of work from Hawk in trying to si right-size uh, VMware post-acquisition. So that's what investors will be looking forward to here on the call. So. Do you anticipate Broadcom making further purchases or does it need to make any further purchases at this point? Well, I think they have had a pretty, uh, you know, pretty strong uh, execution and M&A uh, M history in the last five, seven years. I would say, I uh, you know, started with Cyoptics and LSI, and uh, you know, you can keep adding CA and Semantic and the whole list down there. So I, I wouldn't expect Hawk to stop here. I mean, obviously, software. This one is a huge acquisition. Probably, uh, he probably needs a little bit of time to digest that. But I would expect him to get back on the horse probably in the next 18, 24 months. Um, I more on the hardware side. So. All right, Vijay, always great to talk to you. Thanks for the preview. Vijay Rakesh over at Mizuho Americas. We'll have full coverage after the bell when those Broadcam earnings do cross the wire later tonight. Meanwhile, after the break, in just a few minutes, a sit down with the U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai about the challenges of rapid changes and advancements in technology. That conversation coming up next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. It's time now for our Wall Street Week daily segment. Our very own David Weston, the host of Wall Street Week, went down to Washington and he had a chance to sit down with the U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai. A fireside chat at the Aspen Security Forum in Washington where they covered a wide range of issues. Let's take a listen. We're starting to realize that the implications of a regulatory system that um, uh, started in the 90s and hasn't evolved very far is creating disconnects with uh, the, the implications of this technology advancement. So I'll give you one very, very specific example that I think may resonate with a lot of people because it's a large part of the conversation in so many ways. The unveiling of ChatGPT4 in the spring I think was a wake up moment for all of us that wow, there is a lot of innovation that's going on in our economy. That is a great thing, but holy Jesus, <laughs> uh, what is happening here? And I would just say that even, a, um, even five years ago, um, I had the opportunity to participate in a conference at Stanford where they did a whole AI presentation for us. And at the time, the prompts that you were giving AI were coming out with hilariously funny outcomes. When you ask AI that was being trained to write a joke, and uh, the joke that came out the back end was almost never funny, or it was funny because it was so unfunny, right? So at the time, I think just five years ago, 2019, 2018, we're thinking, wow, this uh, could have a lot of potential. There's so much innovation. There's so much uh, stuff that's brewing. Um, but we don't have to be worried about it yet because it's still very rudimentary. Short period of time, all of a sudden, for all of you who have experimented with ChatGPT4 and you started putting prompts in, it's literally blowing everybody's minds, right? Which is the focus that we have now on AI. What is AI built on? <clears throat> It's built on massive amounts of data. We're coming back to the issue of data. Mm -hmm. How do you develop AI? You have to have access not just to those massive amounts of data. You have to have access to incredibly powerful uh, computing processes. You marry those two up, and you're going to push that innovation and push that development. Who has access? to that kind of data and that kind of computing power, a very small number of extremely powerful and dominant companies that are almost all, if not all, American. And that's why our posture on the rules that apply to data flows, data localization, and source code is so important. At the core of each of these proposals, 
in these negotiations is um, the question that we have to answer around the balance of authority between the private sector and the companies and the government and our regulatory authorities. Who gets to decide or control how freely the data can flow and when it can be restricted, where it needs to be stored, and when access is required to disclose source code. Uh, and I think that those issues are very much consequential, not just for trade and economics, but for our entire society. And the cross-cutting nature of these issues means that if we're going to lead using trade rules at a time when there is no consensus, but massive amounts of debate and questioning, then I, as USTR, am committing massive malpractice and uh, probably committing uh, policy suicide by getting out ahead of all of the other conversations and decisions that we need to make as a country. Uh, on the subject of expanding existing agreements, uh, we had, I believe it's your counterpart in Taiwan this week, say we'd like to have a free trade agreement. Let's expand out what we have right now. Obviously that would raise geopolitical issues, foreign policy issues. Uh, are you open to that? So the negotiation we're having with Taiwan right now, and I'll just highlight here, um, every trade negotiation we're doing right now um, has an element of innovation that's baked into it. Mm -hmm. And this is because we're trying to be responsive to the data and the feedback that we are receiving from the world economy. There are so many changes that are going on simultaneously that I have not met, even our smartest economists, um, even my colleague Janet Yellen, who is a legend in macroeconomics, no one can explain exactly what's happening or predict exactly what's going to happen next. And so from a trade policy perspective, what we have been very disciplined in trying to do is to say, let us bring a trade uh, program to each one of our partners mm -hmm. that's tailored to that partner, that's tailored to their interest and our interest in the partnership, that's also tailored to the challenges and the dynamics that we are um, navigating together in the global economy. With Taiwan, what that's meant is that we have been negotiating uh, agreements, uh, and um, the first agreement that's um, uh, that we have with Taiwan is one that covers, I think, um, five issue areas. Um, it's uh, trade facilitation, it's small, medium enterprises, good regulatory practices, um, and um, uh, oh, I'll have to look at my notes for the other two, but we've got a core group of uh, five disciplines. Uh, we signed that agreement. Um, Congress, uh, in a fit of um, enthusiasm, even though they weren't legally required to, uh, took a vote on it uh, to show their support for what we are doing here. And on the basis of that support, we are negotiating another set of disciplines uh, right as we speak. We've been making excellent progress, and we will continue to look at building out uh, those agreements uh, to, to have an arrangement with the Taiwan economy that is fit for the times. And uh, the times are very challenging. And so this is one of our accomplishments that we are particularly proud of and committed to. So you don't rule out a free trade agreement, but it's not now. Look, so let me let me back up to um, what, what, what do you mean by a free trade agreement, <laughs> right? Do you mean the traditional kind of US approach to a uh, very, very comprehensive, maximally liberalizing, aggressively liberalizing agreement? We're not doing that with anybody right now. Um, it's actually insensitive to the dynamics in the global economy and the U.S. economy right now to push on with that program, which may have been fit for the 80s and the 90s. Maybe it was starting to show its age in the 2000s and 2010s. It's 2023. We need new policies. There's innovation going on all around us. When we were negotiating those agreements, um, I don't know, AI wasn't even a thing that we talked about, right? So in, in all these different ways, but certainly we hadn't experienced the pandemic supply chain discombobulations and disconnect, the fragilities, the geopolitical tensions where we've always had them, but they were different and uh, at a different scale with different partners. So in all ways, uh, as much as we embrace innovation instinctively as Americans, and certainly in our economy, um, we need to be embracing innovation in our trade policy, and that's what we're doing. And that's why when you say FTA, sure, if by FTA you mean, are we innovating trade agreements and are we doing trade um, uh, aggressively, but in new ways, yes. When you say FTA, if you mean the old style trade agreements that we used to do, then no. 
And that was Catherine uh, Tai speaking at the Aspen Security Forum uh, with our very own David Weston down there in Washington. And just as a reminder, you can catch all of these interviews that we air during the close with David on Wall Street Week, which airs every Friday at 6 p.m. New York time right here on Bloomberg television. Meanwhile, we round out to the final hour of trading uh, here uh, on this Thursday afternoon, counting it down to those closing bells and stocks staging a bit of a rally today with most of the major uh, mega cap, big cap tech names out in front here with the Nasdaq up more than a percent here on the day. The Russell, the Dow, the S&P also posting gains on the day as well, fractional to be sure, but we're still watching some pretty interesting moves in the rest of the market. A treasury market kind of resting on pause, if you will, ahead of uh, that big monthly job support scheduled to come out tomorrow morning, 8.30 a.m. Washington time. And WTI crew trying to poke up into the green in the new session, but we should point out it ended the old session back in the red for a sixth straight day. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Just about 3 p.m. in a chilly New York. This is the countdown to the close. Let's get a view from the top. I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Scarlett Fu. And it looks like we're back to stocks moving uh, with a more sizable move in that we're about 1.4% higher in the NASDAQ. And we haven't seen that in a while. Yeah, interesting moves uh, in equities. Uh, and we talk about this idea here of whether this rally or what was a rally, I should say, uh, will sort of resume and carry over into 2024. Uh, you were getting a little bit of a juice here today. And that's largely because all the magnificent seven names really doing their part. Big gains today with uh, Google uh, uh, Alphabet, I should say, up more than 5% here. You take a look at the Japanese yen, uh, dollar yen right now. Uh, I believe that is uh, the worst day right now that we're seeing uh, uh, going back into uh, all year long, basically of December of last year, yeah, uh, relative to the yen, the dollar versus Right, right. Well. Some monster yeah. moves for the yeah. Japanese yen overall yeah. as investors start to anticipate the end of negative interest rates. Uh, when that actually happens is a separate story, and how it actually unfolds is a separate story. But for now, there's reason to get excited. Yeah. And keep an eye on crude prices as well. Softness once again here on the day, kind of straddling the lines between gains and losses. But I do want to go back, Scarlett, to uh, the equity market real quick here because there's a sense here that you are getting a little bit better breath in this market. Mm -hmm. And Savina Subramanian, I thought, her note really kind of hit it on the head that if you are looking forward to broadening out from just a magnificent seven, and I really want you to focus on the bottom of the screen, on the far right and those yellow lines, that's basically taking the number of 52-week highs minus the number of 52-week lows. This is for NYSE stocks that we're looking at here just to be clear Pretty broad. here and you're really so those yellow lines that's basically a positive number mm -hmm. uh, and that's what you want to see and people you want to see a broader it's not quite as broad as what we saw earlier in the year coming in uh, like late late last year into early this year but certainly a big shift from what you saw in the belly of the year where it really was just all just a few dozen stocks leading the chart well yeah with mega cap tech getting more and more expensive people are saying now's the time to look at industrial stocks or some of the value stocks because they do yeah. offer uh, potential upside or better upside let's take a look at one stock that is uh, seeing quite a lot of upside Side at the moment. That's JetBlue climbing as much as 16%, the best rally in three months after boosting its full year outlook. It sees a narrower loss on the bottom line and revenue growth of 4 to 5%, and apparently better than expected bookings and operational performance uh, so far this fall. Yeah, it feels like uh, the, the airlines just can't lose these days. It just seems like every time we think they're finally going to, you know, kind of moderate a little bit, they come back with the forecast that just shows we're still buying tickets. All right, let's also take a look at an, an, a company that we don't hear a lot about. It's a pharma company. Company, spiking higher to a 16-month high. The ticker here is CERE, Cerebral Therapeutics. And you can see that's up 11%. Avvi agreed to buy this biotech company for about $8.7 billion. And this comes less than a week after Avvi announced it's buying uh, Immunogen, the cancer drug company. Yeah, uh, it's uh, interesting uh, moves that were in terms of M&A going on in that space. And uh, Sprinkler, we talk a lot about these enterprise software companies. Here's another mm -hmm. one to add to the list. Yeah, they're not doing well. No, not at yeah. all. Uh, do falling as much as 33%, yeah. biggest drop ever full year guidance disappointed uh, it's got to be consolidation here I mean it's just too many of these names and everyone is trying looking at their balance sheets right yeah. now figuring out how they can cut costs and unfortunately companies like Sprinkler end up getting the short end of that stick stick with us we'll be back here with our cross-platform coverage it starts right now Countdown to the close Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage ahead of the US market close starts right now
This is the countdown to the close. Romaine Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. We're joined right now by our colleagues, Jess Menton and Paul Sweeney, filling in today for Carol Masser and Tim Stenovic. A hearty welcome to all of our audiences across our Bloomberg platforms, television, radio, originals, and our partnership with YouTube here on a day where the equity market's doing well, the commodity market's not doing a whole lot, Treasury's just kind of meh, but upstairs from us right now, guys, there's a huge holiday party going on right now. It is. How many drinks have you had today, Paul? <laughs> no, but there's, I mean, there's everything. <laughs> up there. Now, most of it, I don't know what it is, but it's some really cool... Nuggets. I tried to get some of the but chicken nuggets, and it was impossible, I but I did get a couple other goodies up there, but... Yeah, they've been taking care of us this week. Oh, this they week. have been. It's been uh, delicious. Holiday food and stuff. <laughs> but something Paul and I were chatting about is this story on the terminal looking at the hottest jobs in U.S., uh, also looking at this $80,000 a year that I know that y'all are looking at, Romaine. <laughs> and, but there's another one that I wanted to take a close eye on as far as something that really struck me too, because boozy holiday office parties replaced by guac and <laughs> pickleball. So we were just talking about sort of these goodies that we've had upstairs. I don't know about you, Paul, if you play pickleball. I like guac, though, but it seems like these boozy holiday office parties are... No maybe, they were right of, maybe they were thinking of my generation. I can remember a few of them back in the day. But uh, <laughs> it's nice just having the, the, the holiday celebration. Everybody's back in the office today. Maybe it's the, it's the food and all the party stuff. But yeah, there was no more. You know how bullish you are, Paul, about yes. in office. Yeah. So you're They're back today. They're week. back today. But again, a good day in the market. And I'm just looking <laughs> at this alphabet news. You know, with this uh, Gemini uh, AI product, the street really likes this thing. It's pushing that stock up high. And again, yeah. it's the AI. What's the holiday trade? party over that for the AI, AI folks? I would assume they're holiday. <laughs> Parties, right. Be good. right. I mean, I mean, I don't know. I mean, open AI. That's got to be lit, right? <laughs> Plenty of guac yeah. and pickleball for those going, guys. Uh, let's talk about yeah. that, that story that just Menton mentioned, because we do have Jobs Day tomorrow. It's been a jobs-filled week overall with all the data coming through. The hottest job in the U.S. right now pays $80,000 a year. It doesn't require a college degree, and you it's get like to spend your time instructor? outside. It's not pickleball. <laughs> party party? No, no, no. It's uh, being a technician of wind turbine. Uh, so being a wind turbine service technician, and employment of this position will increase almost 45% over the next decade. This is according to the BLS. They predict this, yeah. and it's going to be faster than in any other occupation. And we know the federal government is subsidizing this renewable energy push. That's because we're putting more of these wind wind. Uh, yes, and they will need repairing. Yes. Okay. This what? is not for me because I do not like heights yeah. at all. Yes, you have to be able to deal with heights. This oh, you true. have to climb up to the top of this thing? Yeah, and you go inside of it and you oh. come out That's of it. That's terrifying. They don't no, have thanks. like a software program that <laughs> I can three, get from the ground? It's 300 feet in the air, and yeah. it's windy because it's a wind farm. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hope it's <laughs> windy, otherwise they have it in the wrong place. Exactly. <laughs> um, but I mean, this is, I always like these stories too, because I mean, in all seriousness, it does show, you know, there are ser obviously significant structural uh, changes to our economy and the way we live and the things we do. And often with that brings up job opportunities as you need people to fill uh, those roles to keep these things, to build these things and keep them working. I'd imagine that you have to be a certain height and a certain weight so that you don't get blown over as well if you're in <laughs> Oh no. right? If I'm only five this, foot, so I know I was thinking this too. Me. As someone who's five three on a really good day, you know, that's that might you're won't be able to three. transition into that job. Yeah. Okay. All right, looking at the, I, I don't know, I'm just kind of looking at this market, seeing how we're starting off December in a pretty good way, because, I mean, that month of November we had, you know, 8.9% move in the S&P 500. That's hard to follow up, but uh, from a seasonality perspective, uh, maybe we'll get some more good news coming in December. Well, I mean, if you look at the forecast, and I'm not talking about, like, the, uh, the, the price targets, but, I mean, the forecast for profitability, the forecast for margin, the forecast even for revenue growth here, it seems to suggest that at least from a corporate fundamental side, there'll be a support there. Now, whether the economy is going to cooperate completely and, more importantly, uh, central banks, that's mm. another discussion. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you look at small caps, though, to Paul's point this month, taken off and, and especially outperforming some of its larger counterparts in latest weeks. But we have to go. We've got some exciting <laughs> things on radio coming up the next few hours. But We're we'll be back, back for Beyond the Bell, close to the closing bell. So stay tuned for that coming up, guys. We'll see you then. <laughs> All right, meanwhile, the holiday party continues right here on the close, counting you down to those bells. Just about 50 minutes or so until we get there, and Mimi Duff joining us right now. She's senior client advisor over at Gen Trust. Gen Trust has about $3 billion in assets under management. Mimi, great to have you here. I hope you were able to partake in some of the holiday goodies upstairs. I'm uh, going to have that guacamole afterwards. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I guess the question, though, are, are we going to be in a celebratory spirit sometime early next year, or is this it? Are we just need to enjoy it while it lasts? I mean, because everyone's sort of looking to 2020 
2024. And I feel like most people are trying to stay optimistic, but I don't see a lot of people making really bold forecasts to the upside just yet. I, I would I would yeah. agree with that. I think that some of this, the last move that we've seen is probably position chasing. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks sidelined earlier in the year with cash rates as high as they were. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the improved data on the inflation side and frankly even on the job side coming into balance has yeah. gotten uh, folks a bit more optimistic. But I wouldn't say to your point that yeah. the, any, anybody's like max long yet. But it gets to the idea, and I'm glad you bring that up too because we were talking a little bit about the competition for, for returns. And, and whether it's equities, whether it's bond market. And, you know, Marco Kalanovich kind of made the point that when you, relative to cash and relative to bonds, equities don't necessarily look so good. And I was just taking a look at this. We focus so much on the benchmark yields, but I, I forgot the six month treasury is at 5.3. And I just tell from personal experience, I have a savings account that's basically paying me 4.9 right now. Yeah, the yeah. Ca cash is good. Yeah. Having said that, in the last month, I think yeah. the aggregate bond index is up 4%. Mm. So you're not going to do that in one month's time sitting in cash, mm. um, which is why we had been advocating to get people invested or at least have a plan to do that. And, um, I mean, what a move we've seen in 10-year yields from 5% down to wherever of 411 right now in just over a month. So um, the market, the, this recent move has been very broad. That's how I would uh, how I would characterize it. This recent move that's being broad, where's that money coming from? Is it people diversifying from big cap tech or is it people coming off the sidelines and starting new positions in things like small caps or value stocks that have been kind of neglected? Yeah, I think on the bond side, probably money coming out of cash, getting put to work, and on the equity side, some of both. I mean, it wasn't long ago, maybe three weeks ago, we were talking about the S&P up 15% on the year and the equal weighted S&P flat on the year, and here we are in this recent move, we've seen that equal weighted outpace the S&P. We've seen small and mid caps, which had really been beaten up. And we've talked about that valuation gap between the, that group and the large cap being uh, near its widest ever just a few weeks ago. So I think folks are looking for value and they're finding it in some of these other spots. And of course, when you look at the rate outlook as well, everyone's so excited about the possibility of a rate cut that they've kind of forgotten higher for longer. We need to get through that period first. How how are you positioning um, your equity holdings to account for a period where rates will stay high, but they will stay at a certain level for a while? Yeah, so I mean, the, just to put it in context, the market's pricing about 100 basis points of easing over the next year starting. There are some probabilities in March. We think that that could be a little premature, even if the Fed's late to the party after they get to where they want to be. On the equity side, we, we do have allocations to small and mid-cap, which will benefit from some of this rate stability, and, and we've seen that. We like also infrastructure. You were talking about the uh, the windmills. We like infrastructure for a longer-term play. Oh, yeah. So you're on the windmill, on um, wind turbine uh, train. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it, it I'm also, not going inside one, I'll tell you that. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, as an investor, not as a, not as a fix, uh, an employee. Uh, it, 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 but it gets to the, bro the broader issue, too, that a lot of the rally this year wasn't just really driven by macro. There really was a component of structural changes to the economy, whether it's AI, whether that's going to bear out or not, that was a, certainly a driver. You could even put in weight loss drugs and GLP and all that here. And it gets to the idea of thematic investing and whether there are going to be themes that unfold in 2024 that are materially different than the ones that people gravitated to now. Yeah, I mean, we don't yeah. have the crystal ball, but I would also add to it that this year we really the market expectations were, were more tilted toward recession, and that recession wasn't delivered, mm -hmm. right? Next year is another beast, because if we look at the savings of consumers across, like that savings has been drawn down, yeah. right? And higher for longer is starting to grip. And, um, you know, the college loan repayments, yeah. if we do stay here higher, it doesn't work for parts of the economy, like yeah. commercial real estate. So I like the optimism, but we, we do need to wait and see into next year how, how this plays out. All right, Mimi, thank you so much for joining us. Mimi thank Duff you. is Senior Client Advisor at Gen Trust. We were talking earlier about guacamole. Coming up, we're going to discuss the health of the restaurant sector. Brian Nickel, Chairman and CEO of Chipotle Mexican Grill, will be joining us. Plus, Naveen out with its global real estate outlook for 2024. Carly Tripp, who leads that team, going to be stopping by the program in just a minute. And you thought earnings season was over? Think again. Lululemon, RH, and Broadcom among the companies reporting after the closing bell will have the results out as soon as they cross the wire.
there. All that and more coming up. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, let's turn our attention right now to food and the health of the restaurant sector. Chipotle Mexican Grill, among the biggest outperformers in the S&P Restaurants Index, shares up more than 50% year to date. And a big question going forward right now as to how much further that rally can go and what actually drives it. Who better to talk to than the CEO and chairman of Chipotle, Brian Nickel, uh, joining us right now here on the big program. Brian, uh, great to have you back here. And let's get right to it. Uh, we talk about dining trends, and we know they shift uh, kind of from month to month and year to year obviously depending on economic conditions when you take a look at economic conditions right now do you see any material impact in what's going to happen inside your stores yeah you know we continue to see a really healthy consumer that uh continues to come to chipotle and you know, i'm happy to say that i think our restaurants are better staffed better deployed and you know we've got our culinary right on point so as guests show up uh, you know, we believe we're giving them great customized uh, meals that they want, and uh, we continue to see strength really across all income cohorts. I am curious about uh, pricing and really the value proposition that uh, fast casual and fast food restaurants have for a lot of consumers out there. Uh, you've raised prices several times over the last couple of years, at least four times on your major items here. And I'm wondering, do you feel like you're going to get to, I guess, set of that breaking point where you feel like that this is just as much as the consumer is willing to take, or is there more room for you to maneuver? Yeah, so, you know, the way we look at that, Romain, is we, we always are trying to evaluate our value proposition. Um, specifically, do consumers feel great about what they're paying for what they're getting from Chipotle? And what we've seen over and over again is the brand continues to be really strong from a value proposition standpoint. So um, currently, uh, we've, seen, we've got some of the best value ratings from our customers that we've had, frankly, in a long time. Uh, and then when we look at where our pricing is relative to the alternative to have the same quality culinary, uh, we find ourselves to be at a significant discount relative to those alternatives. So, you know, we see time and time again, people are saying, hey, look, to get this great chicken burrito or chicken bowl or, you know, barbacoa quesadilla, uh, they feel like, hey, the 10 $15, you know, if you've got guac and chips, um, as part of your meal, mm -hmm. um, they feel like it's a tremendous value because of the customization, the speed, the caliber of the culinary, um, they feel really good about what they're getting from Chipotle. Well, thank you for framing how you're thinking about it. Have you decided how much you'll raise prices by next year? You know, we have not uh, made a decision on that yet. Uh, you know, we've got an estimate of where we think uh, kind of food costs will be next year and where we think our labor inflation will be. And right now we're estimating that's kind of like in the mid single digits. Mm -hmm. uh, we always kind of like to see how the year unfolds and then we make a decision on our pricing. Uh, historically, you know, in normal environments, uh, you know, we usually take about one to three percent pricing a year. Um, but we've not made any decisions yet for next year. Okay, and it should be noted that uh, Chipotle is headquartered in Newport Beach, California. I'm curious, um, given that state's new minimum wage law, how much more prices would need to increase in California because of that? Yeah, look, that's, uh, that's one that we'll obviously have to address. Um, you know, currently uh, we're in like the $17, $18 uh, wage range. So obviously with this moving to $20, it puts some additional inflation in the state of California. We've got about 10, 15 percent of our restaurants here. Um, we haven't made any decisions yet, but I'm assuming uh, pricing will probably have to be part of the puzzle in order to handle some of that inflation. Uh, but obviously, we first look to what are other places where we can get more efficiency, mm -hmm. other ways for us to grow around it. But, uh, you know, with that type of move in such a short order, I'm assuming probably pricing will have to be part of the equation. I, I am curious about uh, some of the menu offerings and whether we can expect something new. Uh, uh, I mean, obviously, I'm sure you've known there's been so much talk about why Chipotle doesn't do breakfast in the way that uh, the other fast casual restaurants do. I'm sure you're tired of hearing that. But there is a growth story that investors want to see. And they want to see that, OK, something new is maybe going to come down the pipeline uh, that they can maybe think will be uh, aid in profitability. 
Yeah, look, you know, uh, I, I will tell you, I, I've had our chorizo with eggs, and uh, it does make a fabulous breakfast burrito. <laughs> we, we have no plans right now, though, to do breakfast. There, there's so much opportunity to grow in our lunch, afternoon, and dinner day parts. Uh -huh. you know, right now, we're closing in about $3 million average unit volumes. We see no reason why we can't get to $4 million. Uh, just winning in those day parts. So significant growth from where we are today just by executing what I say is great throughput operationally. And why is that so important? Because one of the things that's unique about Chipotle is just how fast we can get you a customized, high caliber culinary created meal. And we see time and time again that when we execute the fundamentals of great culinary, great throughput, we are rewarded with more business. And we're seeing that play out in our most recent quarter, and we continue to believe that that's the right focus going yeah. forward. So you'll see us do things like, right now we're doing carne asada. Yeah. We'll probably bring back a chicken al pastor, yeah. uh, have some nice menu innovation. But look, the, the name of the game for us is build more restaurants uh -huh. and grow the lunch, afternoon, and dinner day parts through great throughput. You gotcha. Talk about uh, expansion here. I mean, just yesterday we were talking about, I guess, one of your quasi-competitors, if you will, with McDonald's announcing some pretty big expansion. Ooh plans, as well as some big uh, changes to uh, the insides of their stores as well. I am curious. I mean, you guys have had a, a pretty aggressive expansion, at least aggressive by uh, what Wall Street, I think, had expected here. Is that going to continue? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we only have 3,300, 3,400 restaurants right now in the United States, and there's no reason why we can't have 7,000 plus. So uh, we're going to continue to grow. But in what time frame, Brian? You know, look, I think one of the things we've really focused on is making sure that we open the number of restaurants that support our people capability. So we've given guidance for next year that we'll do, you know, 285 to 315 new restaurants. And we've also shared we want to grow about 8 to 10 percent a year. So, you know, when you start adding that up, you can see we're going to have nice growth every year. We're going to make sure we've got the people capability to open those restaurants successfully, mm -hmm. get great unit economics, and then grow our way to, you know, 7,000 plus restaurants just in the United States. And we're just getting started outside the United States. Right. So, you know, that number doesn't even take into account what I think we are going to be capable to do outside the United States down the road. So as you expand, I'm curious how you're incorporating one of the buzziest themes out there, which is AI, into your processes. Uh, at McDonald's, for instance, just to throw an example out there, they're using AI to train employees, give instructions on how to use or repair equipment, or using AI in drive-through ordering, which actually has been less successful. What have you found works for Chipotle? Yeah, you know, look, where we've used this is more in the in, in the space of forecasting correctly. And the reason why that's so important is, you know, we do fresh prep every day. And when we get the forecast right, our teams then are set up with the right amount of prep in the morning so that they have a great lunch business. And then we come back and do additional prep for dinner. And one of the places that we've seen this really benefit us is being sharper on our ability to forecast what's going to happen that day so that our teams are prepared and they create the fresh food correctly in the morning so we're ready to go. Uh, so that's one place. The other place that we've really invested is more probably in robotics to make the job easier. You know, there's a lot of work that goes into making our hand-mashed guacamole every day. So yeah. we're working on a product right now to cut, core, and scoop the fruit so that then all our teams have to do is add, you know, the jalapeno, the cilantro, the lime juice, mash it up, a little red onion, yeah. and now you've got guacamole. And mm. saving time, um, <laughs> that is... A huge win. And then also, by the way, the process of cutting, coring, scooping the avocado, that, that's a hard process. Absolutely. And, you know, if we can find solutions um, where it makes the job easier, sets our teams up to be successful at lunch, uh, we want to invest in those things and bring those things forward. Brian, before we let you go, I have to ask you about Ozempic and what kind of impact you're currently seeing from the class of weight loss drugs. Yeah, we're, we're not seeing any impact. And actually, as, as we've understood the way the drug works, I, I think Chipotle's positioned uh, really well for those folks that end up on that drug. You know, our food is clean. Our food is uh, customizable, so you can get exactly the portioning that you want, as well as the build that you want. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think we're well positioned uh, for folks that choose to use the drug, but to late to date, we really haven't seen any meaningful impact. All right, that is a headline right there. Brian, thank you so much. Brian Nickel is chairman and CEO of Chipotle Mexican Grill, uh, not seeing any impact from Ozempic, and maybe they'll use AI and robotics to help mash and make, create guacamole, which does sound pretty good right now. But you know, th that's repetitive stress uh, work that is trying for employees. 
employees. Yeah, I mean, can, can help with recruitment. Yeah, too, they can figure that out. I mean, there's a yeah. reason why why humans still do a lot of this stuff because they can do it in a way that the robots somehow can't do it. They would just like smash the avocado into like you know a mess on the floor. But if he has the technology that can do that, yeah, why not? Why yeah. not take pressure off employees? Why not uh, take pressure in pr presumably uh, off costs as well? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I mean, this is all. It'll yeah. take long-term investments as well. I did. I you know I had to chuckle when uh, he gave the response about the breakfast because as you know I mean everybody has been on his back and and his pre even his predecessors are back and why you, why you don't you have a breakfast menu why don't you competing with McDonald's and and the other fast food chains and the breakfast they want to value but that's why but they've they've held firm on that the idea is that yeah I mean they found their their niche and they want to dominate that niche rather than just trying to do what everybody else is doing so I don't you know it's worked for them obviously you see that in the share price and more importantly you see it uh, in their fundamentals do what you do well yeah and forget about the rest this is The Close. I'm Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Just about 30 minutes left to go here in the trading day, Scarlett. And yesterday, there's a lot of price action in equities. Today, we're having a pretty good day, at least if you're a tech stock. Yeah, it's picked yeah. up for sure. Let's take a look at how this is all reflected in the different sector performances. And Romain mentioned, if uh, you're big on big tech, look at the biggest advancers here in terms of sectors. Communication services, information technology, and consumer discretionary. The Magnificent Seven on a roll today. You can see communication services up by three and a third percent. Most of this pie is great. I'm going to let Romain get to the details, uh, the I I exact individual movers here. In terms of weaknesses, we're seeing some weakness in energy stocks, in utilities, and in healthcare. But really, by far, this is an overall update for Maine. Yeah, an overall update. You see 64% of the uh, members higher here on the day. It's not the broadest of rallies, but I think some will take it. I did want to point out a couple of interesting movers here. We were just talking with the CEO of Chipotle about his expansion plan, saying that they can go from roughly 3,000 plus stores to 7,000. Well, Domino's is saying, well, hold my beer. They're planning an expansion plan of about 5,500 stores, and the CEO there is saying that they they could actually achieve a long-term annualized growth rate of about 7%, basically between 2024 and through 2028. Investors like what they heard, pushing those shares higher on the day. Meanwhile, Walgreens Boots Alliance, take a look at this, 8% here on the day. It rallied yesterday on the two-day run right now. is actually its best two-day run all year long. In fact, I think in more than a year, if I double-check that number here. Now, no real news, but there has been some optimism coming back into this space. Remember, this is like the second worst performer in the Dow and one of the worst performers in the S&P this year. Year, as are a lot of its peers. So this could be a little bit of sort of uh, trying to find the bottom and finding value. Meanwhile, PayPal lower by about 2% after Amazon said that it's going to discontinue use of PayPal's Venmo service. And Clavio down 5% here on the day. Down This is the fourth straight day of declines. And take a look at that price, 28.83. Remember, it went public uh, earlier this year at $30 a share. You don't need to do the math. Now trading back below that IPO price. All right, we're going to shift gears here and take a look at real estate because Nuveen has released its global outlook for real estate for 2024. And the firm expects differentiation across sectors and geographies will continue, while pessimism around commercial real estate will cool as we get more clarity on interest rates. Joining us to discuss this report is Carly Tripp, Global Chief Investment Officer and Head of Investments for Nuveen Real Estate. Carly, it is good to speak with you. Uh, when it comes to commercial real estate, are we at the peak uh, when it comes to pessimism for real commercial real estate, or have we passed it? Hi, Scarlett. Uh, thanks for having me, Romain and Scarlett. Great to be here today. I sure hope we're at the peak. Um, what I can say is it's hard to peg the peak. However, if we look at valuations and what's happened since the Fed started its latest rate hiking cycle, of course, real estate valuations have been under pressure. However, we have seen a lot of moderation, um, particularly in the, in the last two quarters. So the wet blanket for the industry overall, of course, has been office. But if you look at other sectors, they're starting to turn the corner, particularly as it relates to industrial and retail. We're seeing very, very strong fundamental performance uh, across housing as well. So not all real estate is created equal. Of course not. I, are you seeing, do you anticipate transactions to pick up though in 2024 as uh, interest rates stabilize or are these kind of just paper gains in the, in the meantime? 
Yeah, transactions are down about 70%. Uh, they have been uh, for the last two years. And so that's that's hampering our ability, obviously, to have a fully functioning uh, capital market system. And what we're seeing now is there's a lot of sellers um, that are, are sit of, sick of waiting on the sidelines, right? They're calling the end of the rate cycle, see more clarity around stabilized valuations. And so in talking to a lot of large investors, particularly in the U.S., they are going to start taking some chips off the table because they do still have a lot of strong embedded gains. And so I think as we normalize and as the uncertainty around rates um, comes out of the market, that we will absolutely see more transactions next year. Carly, I, I am curious. I, I mean, as those trends, if we do start to see a big pickup in that, and this gets, to, I think, partly to uh, your comment uh, to the previous question, which is the idea that this is a market. I mean, we kind of lump everything into the same basket when it comes to commercial real estate, but there are some pretty significant disparities. And just yesterday, we were talking about uh, just how much office still lags, uh, other sort of uh, real estate investments. But I was actually kind of intrigued by how well certain uh, commercial real estate assets have done, at least in the industrial space, and I guess to a certain extent when it comes to uh, 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 what is it like shopping malls as well? Yeah, yeah, it, it is surprising that malls have made a rebound. Um, the American consumer, as we all know, has not disappointed us in in light of even the market uh, uncertainty that we face. So consumerism is still really, really strong in supporting the mall space. There is a bifurcation, of course, um, between high quality malls and not, and a lot of retail has been repositioned. Mm -hmm. So about 130 million square feet of retail over the last five years um, has been repositioned into to other uses, and you combine that with the fact that over the last decade, it's really been undersupplied. And so we have a lot of, uh, well, we have a lot less retail in the U.S. than we did a decade ago, and that's really helped to support that market. If we look at industrial, it's really been the winner categorically. So real estate is an inflationary hedge. That's why we like it. That's why it's a great diversifier during these times to a portfolio. Mm -hmm. Industrial, if you look at the performance, um, fundamentally, operationally, since the Fed, again, we kind of look at it cyclically since they started hiking, uh, income has grown by about 10%, whereas inflation over the same period is tracking around 4%. Yeah. So again, very, very strong uh, performance there. I, I am curious if you've seen, and this may, uh, this may be a little bit harder to extrapolate, but there's been a, so much talk uh, about, when at least in the industrial space, when it talks about kind of modernizing or uh, onshoring our supply chains and modernizing a lot of things that for years we've kind of uh, outsourced to other countries. And I, I know that's a slow process. Process and a much more longer term process. But I'm wondering if you see any upside for specifically real estate investment if that push here in the U.S. continues to bring more stuff back here onto our soil. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if you look at onshoring jobs, They've really picked up over the last year uh, year or two. There's a lot of data supporting that. So we are seeing increased jobs um, from a historical perspective in onshoring. I think more supporting the industrial market, of course, is the continued infiltration of e-commerce. Mm -hmm. um, e-commerce has really become a necessary part of the omnichannel for all retailers, and that continues. But also supply, um, the bottlenecks that were created the inflationary pressures, the lack of labor has slowed supply and delivery. So whereas that was the concern two or three years ago, that's no longer a concern. And we're still structurally um, undersupplied overall for industrial. So that will continue. I think that the most important quality of industrial is location and having access to the end consumer. Um, so that tends to actually be older stock because the older the stock, the closer it is to consumer. So it's not necessarily um, the need to modernize space, depending on ultimately who the user is. Uh, what we look for is really access to the end consumer. All right, Carly, really appreciate your joining us and sharing the overview for 2024 when it comes to real estate. Carly Tripp is Global Chief Investment Officer and Head of Investments for Naveen Real Estate. Now coming up, we've got the top three, our new segment where we focus on the top three movers and shakers at the center of the day's biggest stories. This is The Close on Bloomberg.
It is time now for the top three. Every day at this time, we do a deep dive into the people at the center of the day's top stories. Romain, kick things off for us. Who do you have your eye on? Well, let's talk about Sean Fain. He leads uh, the United Auto Workers uh, here uh, in the U.S. And, of course, he has been the man in the spotlight for a yeah. while. Of course, the big fight against General Motors, Stellantis, and Ford. And he made it clear uh, after closing out those negotiations, he was going after the other non-unionized automakers, including Tesla and Volkswagen. And apparently, according to some media reports, he's already made some progress, at least at Volkswagen wagon and a specific plan in Tennessee where apparently they've signed up about 1,000 non-union uh, workers who are interested mm -hmm. in joining the union. doesn't mean they're in the union now. Right. This yeah. is just the first of yeah. many steps. But, you know, it's interesting because even with the UAW working um, to get those contracts, uh, better contracts for GM, Ford, and uh, what was the last company name? Um, I want to say Chrysler, but it's Stellantis. not. Stellantis. Thank you. I know. My old school brand. Right. Stellantis makes no sense. We've had this conversation. I mean, think, think about all the great brands. Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, all it's that. All Stellantis they could have named that company all that. I know. But chose, Why chose did they Stellantis. do that? It, I think it was like a management consultant came up with that. In any case, um, a lot of the non-unionized... You think management consultant still has his or her job? I don't know. That's a good no, point. Okay. Yeah, a, a lot of the non-union uh, workers also got pay increases as well, in yes. large part because of what Sean Fain was able to accomplish. Yeah, absolutely here. And it'll be interesting to see whether the, the labor uh, gains that were made with unions this year, which, of course, we know is tied to the strength of the labor market, mm -hmm. whether that can sustain itself beyond yes. uh, this year. That is All a right. good point. Uh, speaking of labor markets, uh, Scarlett, you've been taking a look at somebody who I think is doing pretty okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, we are talking about Juan Soto. He is the all-star that was traded to the New York Yankees, marking the second trade in less than 17 months for this 25-year-old outfielder, three-time mm -hmm. all-star slugger. Um, he is going to join Aaron Judge in the outfield. So Yankees fans are rejoicing right now. Yeah, I mean, well, that's going to be a, a killer. Uh, well, not, not just in the outfield, but a killer at the plate, more importantly, uh, assuming uh, that, you know, he stays healthy. And, and yeah, I know, all here. the caveats. So, uh, but I, but I'm confused by this, because I saw you put this story out there to talk about Juan Soto. I'm like, is, is he the most important person <laughs> in baseball right now? Because last time I checked, there was somebody else who was sucking all the oxygen out. Yeah, of he's kind of like the yeah. drumbeat to the big one, right? Okay. Shohei Otani, where is he going to go? Who is he going to talk with? Yeah. This is a big mystery. This is the big question mark during the offseason, and he's going to be the prize Just signing. Tell me he's not going to the Yankees. Well, I know that his uh, yeah. team had spoken with the L.A. Dodgers. Okay. And, of course, he played for the Angels, and yeah. you know, maybe he'll want to stay in Southern California as opposed to New York. Mm -hmm. So, it, I mean, it's a big question mark. It's certain clubs yeah. have a big, big, big yeah. wallet and could yeah. shell out for him. New York well, according, Mets, for instance. according to the reporting I saw, they said basically anything he signs is probably going to be the biggest contract yeah, of ever. any athlete. Is that correct? Or just baseball? Definitely baseball. I don't know about any athlete, okay. but well, he is just... Well, they said it was going to surpass Patrick Mahomes, who's like at 400 plus million okay, then, with then the Chiefs. Yeah. And there was another other one who also had like a 400. Oh, Mike Trout we had like 429. Uh, so they're saying he could be like around 500 million. He is a true two-way player. Yeah. Pitcher and hitter in every way. Yeah. So even when, when he was injured, he was still yeah. in the starting lineup every day. All, All right. right. Our third person uh, out there. Uh, we're going to take Mark Benny off. I guess it's sort of related to the labor market. He, this has been a year of efficiency for him, believe yes, it or it not. Yes, uh, He's actually cut headcount at uh, Salesforce by about 11%. And there's an interesting story in the Bloomberg Business Week uh, this week, the cover story, in fact, about kind of the end of an era, you know, kind of, you know, being a salesperson for some of these tech co companies, software companies, it was a good gig. I mean, you know, you could come in, you could make three, four, five hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars $500,000. You had all these perks, including, as Bloomberg uh, reported, you know, $800 dinners. And it was, it was, just, it was a lavish life. Races. And, you know, if you're cutting costs, you know, you that can't goes away. Yeah, that goes away. I know. And of course, you know, he named his company Salesforce, which just so tells yes. you how much importance he places on the yeah. Salesforce to, to peddle their enterprise software. And in fairness, I don't think he can completely scale that back. And this isn't just specific to CRM. I mean, mm -hmm. there's so many other companies in this space. Without their sales force, they're nothing. You go yeah. ask Microsoft. You go ask uh, 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 ServiceNow. You go ask some of those companies. It's those people on the ground who are doing the sales. But a more efficient sales more. force. More efficient sales force. So only $400 dinners for you. <laughs> that is the cover story on Bloomberg Business Week. A great uh, read here about some of the changes taking place under Mark Benioff. Richard Weiss, I love him. CIO over at Multi-Asset Strategies at American Century Investment. He's going to be joining the program in just a second to help us count down to the close right here on Bloomberg.
This is the countdown to the close. Romaine Bostic here with Scarlet Foo. 10 minutes, Scarlet, till they ring those bells. It's not really a bell, it's like a button. But anyway, 10 <laughs> minutes until they push that they button, the button on the bells here. Pretty strong rally going on, at least when it comes to the NASDAQ. Yeah, the Magnificent 7 is looking pretty magnificent today, and it's driving up the S&P 500 to a gain of 8 tenths of 1%, which um, from what I can tell is the biggest gain in about three weeks. So it's been a quiet uh, three weeks in terms of fairly modest moves, but you have a breakout yeah. today. And again, Magnificent 7 up by more than 2% right now. Yeah, and keep an eye on yields. That's going to be a big story tomorrow morning once we do actually get that monthly jobs report. It's I think the market's story. setting up for that. But then look at uh, a dollar yen. I mean, this is a huge move. I think the biggest move in the, of the year. Yeah, the yen is on a major roll. It's higher against all the major currencies. Um, we have heard from the BOJ governor and his deputies making comments suggesting the end of negative interest rates is coming closer. They mm -hmm. haven't done anything yet, but yeah. they may be getting ready to do they something. They haven't done anything yet, but the market thinks they will. And the market has been thinking they will for I several know. years. I feel like <laughs> several years now. But but yeah, this time it does actually feel uh, imminent, uh, if you will. All right, let's get right to it here. Counting you down to the closing bell with Richard White, CEI, CIO of Multi-Asset Strategies at American Century Investments. Uh, Rich, always great to have you here uh, on the program. And, and I want to start off asking you about kind of the competition for return out there. The idea that, yeah, equities have had a phenomenal year, much better than what anybody expected. And if you believe most of the strategists, it'll have a relatively decent year next year. But as I was telling another guest, you know, I can still get basically four and a half to five percent in a savings account. I didn't have to go into the treasury market. And if I go into fixed income, I can get six, seven on a risk adjustment adjusted basis that is probably better than what I would get in equities. Exactly. That's exactly uh, our thinking here. And and if uh, you know you're expecting a slowdown of any degree, uh, much less a recession, uh, you'll have interest rates coming down further. So if you have any duration in your fixed income portfolio, you'll get that added on as capital appreciation. I, we think bonds are going to give stocks a good run for their money here in early 2024. And cash, mm -hmm. cash, I, I think it's fair to say is still king. You know, granted. Uh, this past year, stocks have had a great return, outreturning cash, certainly. But if you look back to the end of 2021, you look over the last two years, cash has significantly outperformed, uh, let's say, the S&P. I think cash is up around 4 or 5% total return. Mm -hmm. Stocks are down 1% over that period. So fixed income is where it's at. Yeah. Well, so then what do you make then, I guess, of some of the moves that we've been seeing in the bond market, the idea that the peak in rates is behind us and people are now starting to look for four, maybe even five rate cuts into 2024? Is that just wishful thinking? Uh, I, we think so. Uh, we, we think, first of all, stocks have gotten a little bit ahead of themselves. You know, you look at the VIX index, the volatility or fear index, and you see it down at 12 or 13. These are levels we haven't of calmness in, in the volatility index that we haven't seen since before the pandemic. And, you know, I, I don't want to sound like, what was it, Elmer Fudd? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's quiet, it's too quiet yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> but but uh, what, the VIX is that low. Now, granted, Fed funds futures are looking for rate cuts early in 2024 and maybe four or five of them throughout the year. Mm -hmm. and, and I can understand why, because fiscal policy, accommodative fiscal policy is not coming to the rescue in 2024. It's just inconceivable uh, that Congress would have the appetite to pass a big bill with the debt and budget uh, deficits where they are. So it's going to be a lot of pressure on Chairman Powell and the Fed to lower rates as we enter this slowdown, especially if it nears recession, political pressure, market pressure. Uh, but that doesn't bode well for stocks either way. Stocks are earnings yield are what, around 5%? You can get 5.5% in short-term treasuries. Yeah. I don't, I don't see how you can bet on stocks. Yeah, but there are always people who fall in love with a story. And one of the stories that everyone's loved uh, the last year is AI. Is there still any juice left in that AI narrative? And is there any way to participate that aside from bidding up the likes of NVIDIA or AMD? Oh, no question. Yeah, the Magnificent Seven have certainly shown well. I mean, next to, what, Bitcoin, uh, they're some of the top performers, the real stars last year. Uh, but w we see the benefits of, of AI across a variety of industries, the productivity improvements in the medical field, the legal field, and the investment field, right? There, there are many, many uh, jobs requiring rote analysis, which AI is well suited to replace. So 
you know, human or ethical issues aside, uh, the productivity gains in some of these fields where AI will be most applicable are going to be great over the next five, seven, ten years. So when you look at what's going on within equities, um, you, you talk about how the good news is all priced in. Um, at best, we're at the end of the rate hiking cycle. Maybe we avoid a full-blown recession. How much will tomorrow's jobs report kind of give us a clue as to what the direction is for 2024? I mean, are you counting on it to, to move the needle in any way? Uh, well, we know where the consensus is, right? But it, there is this immaculate disinflation, Goldilocks, soft landing, Santa Claus rally uh, <laughs> scenario going on. And, and one thing all of those have in common, of course, is they're, they're myths, right? They're, they're fantasy. They're made up. Uh, but as far as the labor markets go, the, when we start to see cracks in the labor market, it obviously means we're heading into this slowdown that you can debate whether it's going to be a hard or soft landing, but we are slowing down. And the labor market, the jobs market is always the last shoe to drop in an economic cycle. Uh, you know, how fast uh, the unemployment rate rises, what is it, the old SAM rule that's been bandied about recently, yeah. is a good recession indicator there. So if unemployment jumps high, I think people are going to run to the more back to the recession scenario. It's it's a key yeah. set of indicators to tomorrow. All eyes on the job data. Well, Rich, are you, you're drawing cold water on this. I mean, everyone is telling me they see the light at the end of the tunnel here. <laughs> You know, you know, uh, Romain. I, I knew you'd bring that up. I forget if you're you're bringing it up because you're a metalhead, okay? <laughs> but if you remember that, yes. there's a song by Metallica. Metallica. It's, it's No Leaf Clover. It's something like that. Soothing light at yeah. the end of the tunnel uh, may just be a freight train headed your way, yeah. and uh, I, I think that's the lesson there. Again, there's just too much weighing on the economy right now, yeah. combined with. Uh, you know, historically high yeah. debt and deficit levels uh, so that the, the federal government's not going to be able to come to the rescue this coming year. Yeah. Um, all right, Rich. It's going to be have, a rough one. Yeah. All right. We're going to have to leave it there. That wasn't our first Metallica reference on the show, and it won't be our last. I should point out, you did give us, uh, Rich, our first Elmer Fudd reference, I think, on this uh, nice. program uh, ever. Uh, so always appreciative of your time. Richard Wise, CIO of Multi-Asset Strategies at American Century Investments, helping us count down to the closing bell. Scarlett, uh, we're just about uh, two minutes away from that. You're a metalhead? Uh, yeah, there's a lot you don't know about me, Scarlett. Oh, wow. But, you know. Uh, yeah. No, wait, I'm just going to throw another Metallica What's reference that? in there. Pal <laughs> well, as we got puppets for the markets. Yeah, that's right. Full market <laughs> coverage right here on Bloomberg. Stick with us. We're about to take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. We're counting it down to the closing bell, here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast, joined right now by Jess Menton and Paul Sweeney. In today for uh, Tim Stenovic and Carol Masser, a welcome to our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms. That includes television, radio, Bloomberg Originals, as well as our partnership for those folks streaming on uh, YouTube. Jess, a good day in the markets all around, but particularly good uh, when it comes to the big cap tech stocks. Yeah, when you look at this, especially communication services, right, leading the way up around 3% today. That's just tech, right? So thinking about... <laughs> <laughs> it's like discretionary is tech, autos is just tech, everything. Right. Meta, all that stuff. Meta, all right. that stuff, yeah. Well, if you look at Alphabet, though, I mean, yes. it's housed in communication services as well. Yeah. It's Meta. And Remember when Alphabet changed its name and everybody thought the, uh, the most ridiculous Google thing Parent. Ever. It's yeah. still yeah. Alphabet. It's, Google parent. Still, yeah. it's always fun as a reporter to it's have like to put that in my copy, I gotta you say, know how long, Paul. You know how long it takes us bankers to come up with these ticker symbols and then they go switch the name of the <laughs> Did so, you used to do well, that? Well, I think yeah. it's funny, Paul, that they never switch the ticker symbol, right? Shouldn't what? it be like ABC? Yeah, yeah, true. Very good point. Although <laughs> Facebook did change it when it went to Meta. It did, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I have a feeling they're going to change it back at some point. Just tech. Right. Go, right. Meta, all that go, stuff. Meta, there, all right? that stuff, yeah. Well, if you look at Alphabet, though, I mean, yes. it's housed in communication services as well yeah. as Meta. And Remember when Alphabet changed its name and everybody thought it was the most ridiculous Google Parent. It's still Alphabet. It's always fun as a 
reporter to but have to not. put that in my copy. I got to say, how long, You know how long it takes us bankers to come up with these ticker symbols and then they go switch the name of the <laughs> Did you well, used to do well, that? Well, I think yeah. it's funny, Paul, that they never switch the ticker symbol, right? Shouldn't what? it be like ABC? Yeah, yeah uh, true. Very good point. Although <laughs> Facebook did change it when it went to Meta. It did, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I have a feeling they're going to change it back at some point, <laughs> given the way Meta's going, the Metaverse. Whatever happened to the Metaverse? Did I miss it? No, he's still investing in it. It's just not as robust and he's not making such a yeah. big deal about it. Just be quiet. He's focusing on cost cuts, and that's worked for the stock. Yeah, uh, certainly so. And I mean, we should just point out. I mean, we kind of joke about this, but on a day uh, where we're seeing all seven of the mag uh, all seven of the magnificent seven stocks in the green, but firmly in the green too. I mean, Alphabet yeah. up five percent on the day, Meta's up uh, three, and, and Nvidia, of course, which is everybody's darling this year, up more than two percent. Amazon getting a bid as well, Apple and the likes as well. About sixty plus percent of the S and P five hundred moving into the green, and that gives us an eight tenths of a percent gain on the S&P on this Thursday afternoon. That's higher by about 36 points. The Dow Jones Industrial Average up by 63 points or about two-tenths of a percent, while the Nasdaq, which we were just talking about, up almost 200 points or about 1.4 percent on the day. And Jess, let's take a quick look at the Russell 2000, the small caps higher on the day, but the relative laggard, uh, a bit of a switch from what we've seen in previous days, but higher by nine-tenths of a percent. If you look at the number of daily advancers in the S&P 500, up about 63 percent percent of them higher. You look at the daily decliners, 37 percent, Scarlett. Yeah, and that shows up in the sector performances as well. There's only five sectors in the red. Everything else is in the green, led by media and entertainment. So we talk about oh. communication services. You want to slice it a little finer. It's media and entertainment that's leading the way, up three and a half percent. Chip companies, and that's NVIDIA and AMD, up two and a half percent. And autos, Tesla, gaining 1.3 percent. On the downside, energy, uh, commercial and professional services, and utilities in the red. Yeah, I'm looking at some of these gainers here. And we've been talking about it. it's been, been the big tech names. I just look at uh, my good friends at Google, and I'm going to keep using Google. <laughs> Apparently, they have an AI offering as well, Gemini, and that's what the market likes to see there. So you, you got to think of a company with the size and the resources of Google. They, if there's an AI play, they will find it. And then in the chip space, AMD, the CEO debuts a new chip, again, focusing on AI, and he puts out a really bullish forecast on his expectation for the market for the chips for AI. And that got everybody's attention. Uh, and that bit up a lot of anything AI related, and that includes uh, NVIDIA, which had been, you know, and probably still is the poster child for uh, getting exposure to AI. Looking at these decliners, Paul, you and I this morning in pre market, we were talking about Chewy with, yes, I was of course, on in the one and only Tom Keen. It came well off the session low, so closing about six tenths of a percent <laughs> lower now. So really paring back some of those losses from this morning. But that stock did drop after the company did cut its guidance for the full year on net sales. So that did did miss those consensus estimates. Another mm. stock I'm looking at is Sprinkler CXM. That's a $3 billion market cap company, but this is an enterprise software company. So if you look at this, dropping 33%, this is its biggest drop on record. It did come after the company did post a stronger quarter that included a top and bottom line beat. But unfortunately, if you look at some of that growth outlook, it did disappoint investors. And then don't tell Tom Keem I'm bringing this one up, but C3 AI, of course, when oh. we talk about some of those AI and uh, those sort of crypto related stocks, but AI is a ticker symbol on this. But looking at that stock dropping yeah. close to 11%, worst day since September 7th. But this is a data management company, though. Yeah. If you look at this, though, issued a forecast for an operating loss for the fiscal year. Yeah, a lot of the AI names down. We should point out a lot of the enterprise software companies moving lower on the day, including Okta and a few others, on the back of uh, additional uh, weak earnings in that enterprise space. And Clavio now dropping back below its IPO price once again. Meanwhile, you go to the Treasury market and the price action was a little bit more muted. Maybe a lot of folks are kind of waiting until tomorrow when we get a jobs report and next week when we get that big Fed meeting here. But you take a look at the moves across the curve here. Uh, most of the activity you were actually going to find on the shorter end of the curve that pushed the two year yield down just ever so uh, ever uh, just a bit here while the rest of the curve did move higher just a little bit here. So uh, the belly out to the long end uh, a bit cheaper here uh, right at the close. It definitely feels like we're in a holding pattern right now waiting for this jobs report and I'm not sure it's going to clarify all that much right I mean the narrative is pretty much set that the labor market is cooling um, and inflation when it comes to wage increases is going to slow of course it's not going to get to that three and a half percent year over year number that the Fed is looking for but yeah. it's moving in that direction two interesting things in this report we're talking the, uh, the average of estimates uh, uh, based on the uh, Bloomberg survey 183,000 jobs created now uh, Michael McKee points out that about 33,000 of those jobs are related to the UAW 
UAW strike. Yeah. So that puts us more about 150, which is in line where we were last in the previous month. But what I also think is interesting is that mo nobody really expects the unemployment rate to change, and nobody really expects a material change in the rate of uh, average hourly earnings. Yeah, well, I think still, you know, we're looking at real average hourly earning, earnings uh, up about 4% year, uh, year on year on the consensus basis. That's the outlook. That's pretty darn solid out there in a fully employed economy here. So uh, still decent, very strong labor market, very strong labor market. And now we're starting to see it again continue in the wages. Continuing the wages, and it's, uh, you know, the, the definite thinking point here for the Federal Reserve. Just this is going to feed into expectations for inflation, which, of course, is going to be the next data point for everyone. That's coming on Tuesday, so we'll have CPI then. And then PPI, producer price, is also a component, in that is trade services, which is a key gauge if you're thinking about what that means for corporate margins on Wednesday ahead of the Fed decision. So we still have a lot of data coming up before 2.30, and obviously when Powell speaks on yeah. Wednesday, but then 2 o'clock. We also got a lot of earnings. Earnings uh, still uh, hitting the wire, including DocuSign and Lululemon. Let's get right to it. Lululemon shares down here in after hours trading. The headline numbers coming in for the third quarter. EPS at $1.96 a share. Not quite clear the comparison on that just yet. But taking a look at the revenue figures, it does appear to be uh, pretty much in line with estimates. $2.2 billion. The adjusted EPS figure also does look like to be a modest beat. Their forecast for the fourth quarter, here you go. Revenue, a range, $3.14 billion to $3.14 billion. 3.17 billion. Wow. The street was looking for 3.18. So the top end of that range, just a whisper below what the street was looking for uh, here. And the company also saying that for EPS in the fourth quarter, 485 to $4.93 a share. The street on average was looking for 4.93. So the top end of that range meets the average estimates here. So not really uh, looking like it's going to be a major beat should those numbers actually come to fruition. You know, what I'm, I'm looking through the release here, and what's interesting and what strikes out at me is this partnership that Lululemon has entered into with Peloton um, for using its content, its Ooh. digital fitness content. So it no longer produce its own hardware, which is the, the mirror that it acquired a number of years ago, but it's going to use Peloton software. I know that it had been looking to sell uh, the mirror, but uh, was not able to find a buyer just yet. So I guess this is the next yeah, I was, move. I'm actually intrigued by this, because remember when they bought that, everyone kind of scratched their head and mm -hmm. they say, is this really the direction they want to go? And I guess we uh, now have the answer, Paul. You know well, who's big was, on that Peloton? That was on the heels of the pandemic, yeah. which made <laughs> Is Paul. Paul's yeah. very big on I'm um, big on the Peloton bike, <laughs> really? guys. You don't want to go up he against me. He also has the treadmill, but, really? right? We have the I treadmill know this. as well, but so I do not. Do you have the mirror? And I repeat, <laughs> I do not wear Lululemon when I'm on the bike. So just to get that image really? out of your mind. Can I just say, Paul, I'm shocked. You, I, you might want to change your mind. I was a Lululemon hater. And you know what I did? Somebody, I was looking for a good golf shirt. I know you're a big golfer. And somebody recommended one of their shirts. And I'll, I'll give you the exact uh, name of it <laughs> off air. I, this shirt is fantastic, Paul. All right. I, I mean, it is. Shot. The whisk, whisk. If it starts raining, the droplets just fall off. <laughs> it's breathable. It's, uh, I'm just like a salesman for it. I, I, I'm a believer. Now, that's the only item I own from them. But still, it was a uh, very have, pleasant uh, You wear suits every day because yeah. of what you do. But if you could dress down, you'd be wearing Lululemon pants as well. from the waist well. up. Sorry. <laughs> from the waist up. No, we, we have full body shots on the <laughs> television. We know that you're wearing a three-piece suit. Maybe. No, that's... Uh, that's hilarious. But anytime I hear Peloton, I always think of Paul T. Sweeney. That was a pandemic you, stock you, like right. no other boy. Oh, what yeah, a ride. You stuck to it. Look yeah. at you, Paul. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. But before yeah. we move on, I just want to get, sorry, I interrupt, though. We did, we did get some other earnings out of DocuSign, and I just want to point them out because this is one of the biggest movers in after hours trading right now to the upside. They had a big beat in the most recent quarter. Those 3Q numbers on an adjusted EPS basis, 79 cents versus an estimate of 63 cents here. And the revenue numbers also came in uh, about 10 million above estimate. They gave a full year forecast of $2.75 billion uh, for uh, full year revenue here, which would actually uh, top uh, their previous forecast as well as the average uh, on the street. And of course, we're still waiting for Broadcom to release its results as yeah. well after Do it you... absorbed VMware. Okay, yeah, I think we got to go, uh, guys. We should point out RH also crossing the wire. We'll try to break that down for you after uh, the break here, but that net revenue number coming in a little bit light. That does it for our cross platform coverage of the market close on Bloomberg Television, Radio, and YouTube. And just a reminder that Bloomberg Business Week is now on Bloomberg Originals. We'll all be back tomorrow at the same time, same place. And we continue our coverage here on Bloomberg Television. We are awaiting additional earnings results, this time from Broadcom. We'll bring you those results up next, right here on The Close. This is Bloomberg.
A pretty solid day in U.S. equity markets. The S&P, Dow, and the Russell up fractionally on the day, but it was the Nasdaq was a big outperformer, up more than a percent. But here's the thing. Yes, the Magnificent Seven did their job today, but you continue to see when we have these rallies a much broader participation. The chart behind me, ignore the headline, but you take a look at the lines down at the bottom here. These are basically the new highs and lows that we get on a daily basis here, on a percentage basis, I should point out, too. About 11 percent uh, is the line that we have for the S&P. 500. And that's significant here because you can see through a good portion of this year, particularly back uh, at the end of last year and in the belly of this year, we really were not seeing that type of breath. So to start to see that daily breath perk up is a good sign and maybe a sign that this rally does have some legs to it. Take a look at the Nasdaq back above 16,000. Bitcoin taking a bit of a breather after breaching that 44,000 mark. NYMEX crude now higher here in the new session. It basically straddled the line between gains and losses on the day. But the trend line, at least on a technical level, still remains to the downside. A dollar yen was the big outperformer on the day when it comes to the FX space here. Uh, a really, uh, I guess, shocking, if you will, or maybe encouraging announcement or a commentary by Kazuo Ueda over at the BOJ that has a lot of folks betting on uh, yen strength as well as a rise in interest rates over there. Meanwhile, back here, the trajectory of interest rates will be determined not just by inflation, but by the labor market. The monthly job support from the U.S. government set to drop tomorrow. And I took a look at sort of the average of non-farm payrolls. This is a 12-month average. So just to kind of smooth things out, obviously you see the big blip in there on the far end of your screen. That's from the pandemic here. But we're still above trend. And that's a big issue here because the Fed wants to see that softening labor market. And at least based on the 12-month average, we are not there by any means yet. Scarlett. Still a ways to go. All right. And of course, we will bring you full coverage of the jobs report when it comes out tomorrow at 830. In the meantime, we do want to get you up to speed on what happened after hours with Lululemon reporting its results. It gave guidance that was a little bit light of expectations and that has left the stock lower in after hours trade. Let's bring in Bloomberg's John Edwards for more. And John, you look at how the stock has performed over the past year up more than 40 percent. It was kind of priced for every good scenario and not priced for any kind of disappointment. Yeah, that's absolutely Absolutely right. It was really priced for perfection, and even Lululemon couldn't quite achieve that. Uh, so uh, it's uh, you know um, taking uh, taking a bit of a breather uh, there. But uh, yeah, it looks like uh, the uh, the outlook is a little uh, a little light. Uh, there was also some concern on the gross margin uh, figures and operating margin. Uh, those both came in a little below uh, expectations. So uh, something to watch there. You know, if, if they're uh, starting to falter slightly on their profitability, but uh, overall. A, a strong report from them, just yeah. uh, not, uh, you know, as gangbusters as uh, perhaps people were hoping. I, I am cur I, uh, curious. I know this is uh, probably a little less consequential to their bottom line, but mm -hmm. the mirror business, and yeah. more importantly, that hardware business that I think had a lot of people scratching their heads when they moved into that space. Mm -hmm. But they saw a way, at least at the time when they made the announcement that, oh, this is going to bring more people into the store. It was right. a way to keep people connected to mm -hmm. after they leave the store because they would have this at home here. They're now abandoning that more or less here and taking a charge on it. Why? Yeah. Well, it uh, just didn't quite work out mm. uh, the way they were hoping. You know, yeah. the uh, the growth just wasn't quite there, as uh, you know, some others in that connected exercise space have found. It got you know became mm. a very crowded area with not just Peloton, uh, which of course they have a deal with now, but uh, you know with um, yeah you know things like Nordic Track and stuff like that. Nordic so, Track is that still around? Yeah, oh, yeah. They, okay, got a whole thing going. Yeah. <laughs> Nevertheless, they wanted yeah. to sell it and they haven't sold it, so they're taking um, charges related to it. Is this uh -huh. something? they talk about I mean what how how has it worked out for them overall like did it actually bring in the the traffic uh, I think you know not at what they were expecting yeah. basically it's not something yeah. that you know they feel like is going to be core going forward and so you know it's time to basically uh, you know get what they can for it and move on so. all right uh, uh, jo uh, John Edwards uh, who leads our consumer coverage here a closer look at uh, Lululemon uh, numbers that coming in uh, pretty much in line with estimates but the street clearly wanted to see something strong Broadcom earnings, AVGO crossing the wire right now. Shares modestly higher here in after hours trading with 4Q adjusted EPS coming in at $11.06 a share. The street was looking for 1093 revenue coming in at $9.3 billion and semiconductor solutions revenue coming in uh, slightly above estimates at about 7.33. Billion. The company also giving a forecast for 2024 revenue of about $50 billion on a full year basis. Ed Ludlow joining us right now to walk us through uh, anything additional that he might see. And more importantly, Ed, kind of what we should hear or what we expect to hear once we get to the conference call. 
I think the important thing is that in the fiscal fourth quarter just gone, those numbers do not reflect any contribution from VMware, right? Because that is a transaction that closed in the quarter on November 22nd. Uh, on the semiconductor side of the business, they were ahead of what was seen as pretty low expectations. We beat in the fourth quarter on the top and bottom line. But remember, this is the slowest pace of growth for Broadcom since 2020. And the story for them is that their end market customers like Apple struggling to sell handsets. They also make the chips that basically help uh, different computers within a data center system or different server designs communicate with one another. Then when you look at the full year outlook for 24, that does include VMware, but the guide we're getting, Romain, is that on the semiconductor side of the business, they'll continue to grow in the high single digit range, um, which kind of tells you that things might improve slightly from where they currently are. Mm -hmm. Top line growth of 4% in the quarter gone. Where's that AI love for Broadcom mm -hmm. that everyone else has got? Yeah, well that brings me to my question, which is AI, and I'm sure it's something that the one to talk up what yeah what kind of concrete um, benefits are we expected to see when it comes to Broadcom and AI because all the talk so far has really been about how you're not going to see any real result until the second half of 2024 yeah, I mean, Hock Tan has really talked up the AI potential over a number of quarters, saying that the turnaround will be quick, mm. right? That it could be 25% of revenue pretty quickly. Think about it in the data center context, right? The GPU has stolen the limelight in the AI story. But if you're going to build data centers and server designs powered by cutting-edge GPU, you need all the other cabling and networking gear that goes with it. And Broadcom could potentially be a beneficiary of that. And that's where he's talked it up. And I imagine on the call he'll talk it up again. All right, Ed Ludlow, we will watch for headlines from the earnings call after Broadcom reported results. It was a beat on the bottom line here, 11.06 for the fourth quarter adjusted EPS, but the stock is down. Thank you so much. Coming up on the close, we'll be hearing from Christine Benz. She is director of personal finance at Morningstar about where you should put your money in 2024 when you want to make the most of it. It's a planning series on where you should go for uh, your money moving ahead. This is the close on Bloomberg. Chip Berg, the CEO over at Levi Strauss, will be leaving the company sometime uh, next year. Uh, Berg, of course, who uh, took over as CEO uh, back in uh, 2011, coming from Procter & Gamble, is uh, said to be stepping down in April. Uh, they are going to promote Michelle Gass, who, who is currently president, and they will promote her to be both president and CEO. Uh, Chip Berg, Scarlett, going to be retiring April uh, 26 over at Levi uh, Strauss. And that's not the only change. We also got word from Crown Castle, an, an infrastructure read, that they're seeing CEO is also retiring. Jay Brown is retiring as president and CEO, and so the company has named Anthony Malone as its interim CEO. Uh, Crown Castle, once again, the infrastructure re also announcing a CEO transition. Yeah, and that's interesting, too. I mean, he's been there for a while. I can't remember when he exactly took over, but he's, he's been with that company uh, basically uh, since uh, the late uh, 90s. All right, we do want to pivot uh, away from that and go to the world of, well, personal savings, personal investments, personal finance. Money market fund assets continue to rise, rising to $5.9 trillion. That's a fresh all-time high. It's a sign that people are getting more comfortable parking their money in these funds amid high interest rates. Christine Benz is Director of Personal Finance at Morningstar, and I'm pleased to say she joins us right now. And Christine, I do want to start off talking about personal savings because, as you know, there was a pretty extended period of time in this country where it didn't seem like anybody was saving any money, at least not uh, as was reflected in any of the aggregate numbers. Has that changed meaningfully, or are we just talking more about it. Well, we did see a really great trend in savings during the COVID period, as you would expect. People <laughs> didn't have a lot of things to do with their money, so we saw savings rates really jump in kind of the 2020-2021 period. Last year, we saw a significant erosion in personal savings. I think it's a combination of a higher inflation, more recently higher interest rates, and now with uh, student loan debt repayment coming back online, I think those factors have conspired against savers and have made it difficult for people to find assets that they can put away for the short or long term. Uh, overall, I mean, depending on how you were invested this year, it, this has been a pretty decent year, whether you're invested in equities or even in uh, uh, bonds and fixed income and other areas as well. Of course, as you know, that raises a lot of 
the tax implications as you get to uh, the new year, as people now have to kind of take stock of what they made and what they lost and how that is going to sort of be reflected in what the IRS wants you to reflect. Absolutely. So we cover a lot of mutual funds here at Morningstar. One thing we've seen is that these funds make these capital gains distributions, typically in the December period. And because we've seen investors retreating out of actively managed mutual funds over the past several years into exchange-traded funds, which they perceive to be more tax efficient, the problem is if you're left in a an actively managed fund, you've had these big capital gains distributions, which in turn trigger a tax bill. So it's been been a bad cycle for mutual fund investors. Cash investors with yields higher, of course, there's nothing wrong with that. But from a ta tax standpoint, that gives you a bigger tax bill as well. So my guess is that investors will see more uh, taxes associated with their accounts for the 2023 tax year. Do you see investors worrying about the interest rate, rate environment as they make their plans for retirement uh, for 2024? Or is that something that they feel, because I can't control this, because it's so data dependent, because it seems to change day after day, I'm not going to put too much stock in that? Well, my hope is the latter, that investors just sort of maintain that long-term mindset. One thing we've seen is that investors have been a little bit more active. You mentioned that, um, that we've seen great inflows into money market funds. My worry is that some investors are overdoing the cash accounts, especially given that we know, you know cash will underperform bonds and certainly stocks over long periods of time. And, you know, if inflation is even a little bit above the, the 2 or 3% range that gobbles up every bit of your purchasing power. So I am a little concerned that some investors are actually overdoing the very safe investments. Maybe they're worried about interest rates or what might happen with the equity market. If the Fed does end up cutting interest rates, um, how quickly would we see savings account rates, the high yield money market rates, um, the CD rates start falling? D does that happen instantaneously? Does it happen by the same margin? It depends on the, the product, but typically we do see a pretty rapid reflection of lower yields in the form of lower interest rates on savings products. There's a, a pretty direct correlation. So savers will see that decline reflected pretty pretty quickly in their savings in instruments that are on offer at their banks. I, I want to talk about uh, some of the uh, uh, demographic differences. And I mean, uh, demographics, I mean age. Obviously, you know, a six-year-old is going to probably invest a little bit different than a 20 year old given uh, the shorter time horizon. But I'm wondering, are there any sort of ties that bind that, that would bind those two sort of groups, you know, meaning the younger sort of cohorts out there and the older folks who are closer to retirement? Well, the interesting thing is, you know, it's been such a great equity market for so long that even though the older cohort should be de-risking their portfolios a little bit as retirement approaches and as they get closer to de needing their funds, my sense is that uh, it's very difficult to get them to de-risk because they've had a great experience in stocks over the space of several decades. So I think that that's a tie that binds younger and older savers is uh, there is a fairly strong risk appetite from both groups. And, and there's a sense, too. And, and I mean, I could just tell you, I mean, I've had family members who are either at or, or either in retirement or close to it who've kind of raised this issue, right? The idea that they know that they're supposed to be, in theory, moving into fixed income and things like that and basically preserving cash. But the idea is that they've had so many gains, they feel like, why would you want to miss out on another 10 or 15 percent run? Right. The, the FOMO is real for people who are getting close to retirement. Um, and certainly bonds are just the least loved asset class, especially given what we saw happen with interest rates and their effect on bond prices in 2022. Yeah. It's very hard to get older investors hmm. to even consider bonds. It's either yeah. cash or equities and, and forget bonds. Yeah, it's a little bit of a hard sell. Christine, really appreciate your joining us. Christine Benz is Morningstar Director of Personal Finance. Coming up, will the rally in AI stocks continue? New Construct CEO David Trainer is our next guest. This is The Close on Bloomberg.
Romain Bostic here with a look at how stocks performed here on this Thursday afternoon. An up day after three straight days of either losses or basically a flat line here. The S&P 500 posting an eight-tenths of a percent gain, flirting with that 4,600 level. Now, we should point out, looking at some of the technical levels, there still does seem to be a trend line that kind of points to the downside. But that could flip in a big way. Tomorrow morning, 8.30, we do get the latest monthly jobs report. And a week from now, we're going to get, of course, the next Fed meeting, the last Fed meeting of the year here. So what actually transpires there with regards to the rate tightening cycle and whether all these rate cuts being priced in for 2024, that could prove to be a big catalyst or maybe it could prove to be a wrong direction. I want you to turn your attention just real quickly to some of the other risk assets here. We did see a slight pullback in Bitcoin and we did see obviously a bit of a tamp down going on today once again in the commodity space. But nevertheless, a lot of people are still finding some degree of risk appetite out there, Scarlett. In fact, the biggest mover in the S&P 500 today was AMD, Scarlett, on the back of that AI optimism. Yeah, the AI optimism that lives on. And of course, it's driven the NASDAQ 100 up 1.5% today, as you were, sh you were showing us. Will the AI boom keep fueling gains in 2024? That's the big question here, uh, given the big gains that we've seen in 2023. David Trainer is CEO at New Constructs, and he joins us now. David, this idea that AMD is the next best thing if you don't want to get in and on NVIDIA at this moment because the prices have gone up so much so fast. Does, a does AMD look like a good alternative to you? It doesn't. It's really expensive also. And the current price implies that their margins are going to triple while also growing the, the top line at 15% compounded annually for the next 15 years. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's got a huge turnaround in the profitability of the business already baked in. And it's not nearly as profitable as NVIDIA. So, yeah, there, there's not there's not a lot of upside there. I think everyone has found it. Uh, that that's not a secret that you can, where a secret stock you can get into and, and hopefully get in before everyone else has figured it out. Okay. All right. So if you can't get in on AMD because that time has passed, what's to stop you from getting in on Nvidia? Because by and large, it's it has the most market share when it comes to these AI chips, right? Something like ninety percent. They can't make them fast enough to meet the demand. Uh, the valuations might be out of whack, but it'll. It's the excitement that's driving the story. And again, uh, NVIDIA really doesn't have that much competition. Yeah, I mean, we say that now, but I think everyone else is uh, looking to try to, you know, compete with the business that's making so much money uh, that, you know, people don't leave businesses that are profitable alone. And so uh, if you want to if you want to invest based on excitement, uh, absolutely chase the most exciting stock. Yeah. Uh, if you want to look at fundamentals, you know, and NVIDIA is even more expensive than AMD, yeah. uh, quite a bit more. Well, that gets to the point, and, and we should point out, I mean, David, I mean, your background is really in su kind of sussing out these types of evaluations and whether uh, they're right or wrong or at least attractive or not. And I do wonder, I mean, AI is a thing. It's been a thing for a while. It's probably going to be a thing in the future. If you look past NVIDIA, AMD, Microsoft, and a few other, other big names here, do you think we will get to a point where fundamentals are going to sort of match up to some of the hype and the media attention? I should hope so. Uh, you know, otherwise, we're, you know, you're chasing a lot of good money after bad. Yeah. But look, at the end of the day, we have a limited amount of resources. If we're going to waste it in overvaluing certain assets, that's bad for society. And so you want to reallocate that capital to other growth areas. Maybe the next thing after AI, right? Mm -hmm. But just piling in because everyone else is piling in, it seems popular, is not a good strategy. It can be in the short term, uh, and you know it works if you're into the greater fool theory. Mm -hmm. But uh, we don't believe in that here at New Constructs. We really care about yeah. balancing fundamentals with risk and making intelligent capital allocation decisions. That's what we're really trying to get at. Well, then doesn't that get to this idea of the application of of, of AI? That this isn't just about selling chips and and, and running chat <laughs> GPT bots. That this is about how companies can sort of take this technology, integrate it into their own business or into their clients' business in a way that aids in revenue new growth and profitability. Uh, have we seen that anywhere? I mean, I feel like there have been a few smaller companies that have basically seemed to suggest that they are on that path. We maybe not have not seen that with some of the larger ones. Romain, I think you nailed it, right? Look, we can talk about AI all we want, but until it actually makes the world a better place or makes a business more profitable, it's all just a bunch of talk, right? And so, you know, like for example, here in New Constructs, we use AI to pull footnotes out of financial filings and get a truer measure of earnings. That's a real application. 
right? And that takes a lot of hard work. It's not, it's not really all that sexy either. There's a lot of m- meticulous going through lots of documents that has to be built up in order to do that. Yeah. And at this point, yeah, I think there's just a lot of hype around, oh, AI is going to change the world. Yeah. You know, my chat GPT wrote my paper for me. You know, what I think it's really doing is, is, is what automated assembly lines did to factory workers, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. It's, it's just forcing the level of value add up for mm. society. And that's not going to make people a lot more money. It's just going to maybe cause a lot of people to lose their jobs. <laughs> that's one way of looking at it. I'm curious, David, when you get questions from clients on AI, what does it usually, what are they usually asking about and what are you usually trying to tell them? I'm trying to explain that that AI is not something as flashy and great as people think. I don't really believe that there's such a thing as artificial intelligence because for me, intelligence means that there's some sense of discerning pattern and, and intuition that you don't ever get from a machine, right? Uh, the Turing test is, is is a very, very super simple test. Uh, that's not real intelligence. Uh, what I what I suggest is they they understand um, how the AI, like Romain was asking, is going to add real value, you know, and for us, you know, we've meticulously marked up hundreds of thousands of filings over the years so that we can feed that to a machine and the machine can then go in and help us find footnotes faster because it's got 500,000 examples of how we found them in the in the past. And, and, and that's where people yeah. kind of think that AI is like in machine learning, it's like some magical fix. So we don't have to do work anymore. Yeah. No, no, no. No, it only sits on top of what's really good hard work mm-hmm. first and foremost. Without that, AI is just a bunch of hype. Yeah, well said. Um, I, I am curious, though, as to why you don't think, and I don't know, maybe this is a kind of an ignorant question, but why you don't think more investors have sort of gravitated to that sensibility, right? I mean, it's easy to get caught up in the hype, and I understand there are a lot of short-term returns that people are chasing after. Fine, go for it. But when you talk about this idea of looking at the fundamentals, going through the earnings release, uh, uh, excuse me, the uh, filings and things like that, it's almost quaint. I feel like, I mean, who does that anymore? It's like you and like five other guys out there. But it, does it get to a point where the market pricing and the market direction moves in a way that forces more people to take a closer look at those fundamentals. I mean, from, from, from your lips to God's ears, you know, I have no idea, right? We've been wondering that for a long time. And, and you know, these phenomenons that keep coming in succession, first it was meme stocks and, and, you know, and now it's AI, right? It's like all these things are reasons for stocks to trade disconnected from fundamentals. Uh, and we've got people getting away with all kinds of things that, you know, when I was on Wall Street, they would have been perp walked. I mean, the things that <laughs> Kathy Wood and Elon Musk have gotten away with saying uh, to the public misleading statements, you know, it, it's like anything goes. I mean, you know, meme stocks, the company's about to go bankrupt. You know, look at what happened with WeWork, right? Yeah. You know, they faked they faked a buyout. I mean, uh, it's like markets are bonkers. And Romaine, what it's going to take for people to kind of come back down to fundamentals, I, I don't know. I, I, you know, I wonder, I wonder, and, and look, yeah. I don't think that everybody wants that though, right? Wall Street makes a lot of money tricking people into, you know, paying yeah. 15 billion for sweet greens or for Beyond Meat or for Peloton. Uh, I'm, I'm you know, curious, David, when you said Kathy Wood, what in particular did she say that, that offended you? Because it's, it's not as if she's making promises that can't be kept. She's just giving her projections for what she thinks would happen with the company. I wasn't offended by anything she said, but her, her misleading statements about the performance of her fund, right? Saying what she was going to do and what kind of performance she was going to project, project that's, that's, that's technically illegal. Uh, promising returns. Uh, that's the bottom line. That stuff is not supposed to be done by a fund manager. So um, yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying would have been, would have gotten people in a lot of trouble in, in prior periods. All right, uh, David, uh, always great uh, to talk to you. Uh, David Trainer. he's the CEO over uh, at uh, New Constructs. And Scarlett, uh, uh, you know, I love David. He has, always has uh, great insights as well. And there is a fundamental issue here about how Wall Street has changed and the promises that mm-hmm. uh, certain fund managers as well as CEOs and things they make. You reference, of course, Kathy Wood as well as Elon Musk. We should point out, uh, at least as, as of right now, we don't know of any uh, sort of formal uh, investigations no. into them and the things that they've said. But uh, there's been a lot of anecdotal evidence about 
kind of, you know, whether what they said did match up with reality, and we can have that debate here. And we've had Kathy on this program mm -hmm. uh, plenty of times. Uh, she can defend herself, uh, and I'm sure, and Elon Musk, of course, can defend himself. So I'm sure he'll never come on this program, but he's welcome to as well. Elon, yeah. come on to the program. Yeah. Well, I mean, this always happens in any period yeah. where you have excessive gains and people get excited about something in too short amount of time, right? Yeah. That people, people's emotions get the better of them, and people start uh, stampeding in yeah. without looking at all the numbers carefully. Yeah, absolutely here. All right, uh, stick with us here. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into the labor market. Of course, there is a big report set to drop tomorrow here in the U.S. Lee School, senior economist at the Economic Policy Institute. She's going to give us a preview. This is Bloomberg. It is all about the jobs report tomorrow, the crucial jobs report that will set the market direction. Abigail Doolittle has more on what we might expect. Abigail? It is certainly a big one, Scarlett. And what we're looking for for the month of November are non-farm payrolls added of 185,000. Now that's up from 150,000 in the month of October. And we're also looking for the unemployment rate to stay flat at 3.9%. In some ways, this could be considered a Goldilocks report because if it comes in around these levels, it won't be too hot or too cold to really move the markets all that much. We'll be talking about that in a moment. But first, let's talk about ADP earlier this week. So what we're looking at here uh, in blue are the ADP reports, uh, excuse me, in blue, the non-farm payroll reports. In white, the ADP reports going back. There isn't much of a pattern here, as much of a pattern person as I am, and I always like to find a pattern. Uh, there were a number of months where ADP outperformed. Uh, more recently, non-farm payrolls have been outperforming. What we do know is uh, ADP reports came in at 103 3,000 jobs added, so about 100,000 less than what is expected for non-farm payrolls. As for the two-year yield and market reaction, well, if it comes in well above, that could certainly send yields higher as folks think that the Fed will stay higher for longer or maybe even have to hike. We haven't heard that idea in a long time. Or if it comes in uh, better than expected in terms of lower, then you could see yields go down on the idea that the Fed's not going to have to cool down the economy all that much. Right now, the two-year yield is hanging on to a trend line uh, in a very cautious, uh, last grasp type of way, trying to get back above its 200-day moving average. Tomorrow might give us some clues. If it doesn't, we're going back most likely to Silicon Valley bank lows. Not sure that that's what the Fed wants. So, of course, we have the FOMC next week. And then let's tie stocks into yields, because, of course, when yields go higher, that means, or investors take it, and it does mean, eventually, uh, that liquidity is coming out. So what we're looking at here in white the S&P 500 yields. You can see earlier this year uh, when yields were going higher, that 10-year yield going up close to 5%, the S&P 500 lower, an inverse re reaction. That's why, Romaine, of course, this is such a big report. All eyes on November non-farm payrolls report tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. Eastern. A nice setup there, Abigail. Into our next guest, Elise School, joining us right now, senior economist at the Economic Policy Institute to talk about uh, tomorrow's uh, jobs report. Maybe it is big, Elise. Maybe it is small here. I'm curious about your expectations, particularly on the headline employment growth number, and whether that growth rate is something that we need to be concerned about, or is it more kind of in line with where it's supposed to be anyway on a historical basis? I think it's very much in line. I am very optimistic about where the labor market is right now, and I think that what we're going to see is a continuation of what we've seen. So there is some moderation. There is slowing in the pace of growth, but that's still growth. When we're talking about job numbers in excess of 100, easily 150,000, that means we are keeping up with population growth, the working age population growth. We're pulling in workers off the sidelines month after month. That is a solid growth. That is a continuing strong economy. And it's an economy, as you point out, that has still been resilient to those interest rate hikes that we've seen over the last couple of years. I am curious about a one trend, or at least the potential trend that a lot of folks have focused on, and that's the idea that we could actually maybe start to see a decline in the labor force, the idea that uh, some of the pandemic era and other uh, government measures that were made uh, to sort of help get people back into the workforce, like child tax care, cre child care tax credits, et cetera, that with those expiring, that could potentially force a lot of uh, prime age working women back to the sidelines. Yeah, it's an interesting question because we actually are seeing prime working age women, that share of 
workers, a share of women, I should say, between 25 and 54 years old, we are at an all-time high in terms of the share of that group of women who are working. And so we're not seeing any declines yet. Uh, that has certainly uh, been resilient, even though those policies have now long since expired. So it is a positive trend. I think that that is one that uh, we definitely want to keep an eye on when the data come out tomorrow. And of course, um, the non-farm payrolls number is a big headline number, but we're also looking at the unemployment rate, which is expected to stay unchanged below 4% at 3.9%. So no excitement there, but you are looking within that unemployment report at certain demographics, young adult employment and unemployment, uh, black unemployment. What do you anticipate? Right, you're right. I think that it expect overall unemployment to stay below 4% um, or at or below. That will mean two years of at or below 4% overall unemployment. When we look for signs of trouble, right, um, I think we often tend to look at those historically marginalized groups, those are the ones that are going to get hurt first, often historically has uh, that has shown us. So we look at young workers, look at black workers, look at their unemployment rates to see where that is going. Not any one month trend, but to see, you know, is there start of something um, troubling? We have not seen that yet, but those are some of the places that I would be looking. I'm curious, at this stage of the economic cycle, given where we are now, given what has happened in the macro economy, what do we know about the sectors that tend to be strong uh, in terms of increasing hiring or at least uh, able to keep up the pace of hiring? Right, so we continue to see healthcare very strong. I think that in this report, we're gonna see this uptick, a larger uptick in manufacturing as workers have gone now, those striking workers have gone back to work. Another sector that I'm looking closely at is the government sector. The public sector has been slow in getting back to pre-pandemic levels. Overall, federal, state, and local has now returned back to pre-pandemic levels, but state and local, just that part of it has continued to lag. And I'm hoping that we'll see a strong enough report tomorrow that those are also back to those levels. Again, those levels are a low bar when we think about what kind of benchmark we want to see, because we've seen population growth. Uh, we've seen growth in, let's say, students, uh, so that we want to make sure that the services that those state and local Local employees provide can be provided and that might take even higher employment levels than we saw before the pandemic. Is this the that immaculate soft landing Elise that everybody was talking about? I've been very pleased with what the labor market has done. I think it has been resilient to those interest rate hikes. So I think we can continue on that path and that would be great. Does this sort of remove, or not actually remove, but does this sort of mitigate maybe some of the inflationary concerns as well that are still lingering out there, at least if you believe that the Fed has to get down to that 2% uh, target in order to claim victory? Right. So when we look at what is happening with nominal wage growth, that's one of the key indicators that the Federal Reserve will look at. We have seen deceleration in nominal wage growth. So I think, well, do we want to see wage growth decelerating? We want to see it decelerating. We've seen inflation coming down much faster. So as prices, uh, the rate of price growth falls faster than inflation, then, I'm sorry, the rate of price growth falls faster than we're seeing nominal wage growth fall. That means that people's purchasing power has gone up. So their real wages are going up. That's a positive sign in terms of their purchasing power. And that deceleration in nominal wage growth is just what the Federal Reserve wants to see to hold off making any changes at this time. A lot of the times when we talk to people about the monthly jobs report, it's seen as backwards looking. It's There's a lag effect. And by the time you see it show up, it's already been happening in the real economy, which is why there's so much more emphasis put on the weekly jobless claims, which, of course, do tend to be bumpy, but can signal when there's an inflection point. Have you seen anything in the jobless claims that, that suggests any level of alarm to you? Yeah, it's a great question because there are a lot of other data points that we have to look at. I have not seen anything in the jobless claims. Uh, when we look at the job openings and labor turnover survey, that as well, that came out this week, again, more of a lag. But you're not seeing any uptake there at all in terms of layoffs. Uh, things are renormalizing there as well. Is there anything in the data that, that doesn't shed light, for, shed light on the state of the labor market for you? I mean, is there anything that you wish the data would tell you that we still don't get? That's a great question. Um, I think that you know we want to make sure we have accurate, up-to-date data. I think it's important to look at all the different demographic groups to know uh, what's going on. We want to make sure that we have really great sample sizes, and the Bureau of Labor Statistics works to um, make sure that we're getting the most accurate data as possible, as as quick as possible. So I think that they're they're doing um, a really great job of providing that. And we want to look at all the different numbers that come under that. 
Um, I think that another indicator we want to be looking at is work hours. Make sure that that is, is holding mm -hmm. up. So even if hourly pay is going up, we want to make sure that people are getting enough hours of work. So that's another one to look at. All right, Elise, always great to talk to you. Elise Gould, senior economist at the Economic Policy Institute. A preview of those numbers that we're expecting tomorrow. Uh, the average of estimates of economists surveyed by Bloomberg puts it at about 183,000 jobs. So Bloomberg Economics is a little bit lower on that, seeing only about 160,000 created and downward revisions from the previous month. Unemployment rate expected to stay at 3.9. Team surveillance will have full coverage at 8.30 a.m. Washington time tomorrow. Stick with us here on The Close as we close out the show will set you up for some of the other big things that investors will have their eye on tomorrow. This is Bloomberg. Let's push ahead to what markets will have their eye on on Friday. I'm told, Scarlett, there's a big economic data point coming. Yeah, one word, jobs, or maybe we should say it five times. Jobs, jobs, <laughs> jobs, jobs, jobs. <laughs> it's all about the payrolls number. 183,000 is the consensus estimate. It's a range from 45,000 to 275,000. And our coverage, of course, will start uh, tomorrow morning with team surveillance. After those numbers come out, we're going to have a slew of interviews to break it all do down, including with the acting U.S. Labor Secretary, Julie Sue. And, of course, the former New York Fed President, Bill Dudley, Mohammed Al. Arian, other uh, big thinkers will be joining us to give us their take. In the midst of all that, we're going to get the latest reading on the University of Michigan consumer sentiment data. This is now the data for the month of December, kind of the preliminary number. Yeah, and this is, is subject to revision, but I'm always curious about what people say about inflation coming up. How do you know how to project what inflation will look like in five years' time? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what it's going to look like in six <laughs> months' time. Exactly. But there, there you go. Survey data is survey data. The NASDAQ 100, this is the annual uh, announcement of the reconstitution of the NASDAQ 100. But I'm curious as to what they're going to do this time because usually it's because some small company has become big and they want to put it in, but... What happens when the big companies get bigger? There you go. Scarlett and I will be back tomorrow. Balance of Power is up next. This is Bloomberg.